Hello and welcome to everyone. Um, my name is Noah Efron. I am so, so deeply happy to be here tonight with some astonishing people, as you'll see, to welcome into the world and to celebrate a new book, American Trip, Set, Setting, and the Psychedelic Experience in the 20th Century by Ido Hartigson, of course, published on Bastille Day of this pandemical year, 2020. Uh, a new book is always a cause for celebration and how much more so when it describes a piece of the world that you thought you understood in a way that makes you see it new, the details sharper, the colors brighter, and everything more profound than you saw before. And that's what this book does. I will leave the discussion of this book to our spectacular speakers, but I need to say a word about the book's author. I first met Ido Hartigson in person when he applied to our SDS program at Bar Ilan to do his doctorate. And I say in person, of course, because by then he had already made a name for himself. He had written several beautiful essays in Haaretz and was a figure of some renown on the internet, even in those days before social networks. And when it came time for Ido to write his doctoral dissertation, which in the fullness of time became the starting point for this Bastille Day book, though the book is very different, it was my great good fortune personally to have a hand in the project. Ido's virtues as a researcher then and now are his virtues as a person. His curiosity is infinite and it's aided by a profound humanity with which he goes through the world, a decency with which he goes through the world. He never assumes that he already knows. He always wants to learn to understand deeply and then deeper and then deeper still. There is to Ido a uh, gentility that I think leads the world to just open up to him and before him. There's also a warmth, a kind of concern and a love for the humans and for the odd things that we humans do and for the strange places that we find ourselves. For all these reasons, people just want to speak with Ido. They're eager to be interviewed by him. They're sorry when the interview ends. Honestly, I think that the documents in the archive want to be read by Ido. Also, behind the gentility and the warmth in Ido, there's a certain tenacity and steely resolve. I have watched him wrestle to understand a point for days and then for weeks, long after most of the rest of us would have given up. But maybe most of all, Ido has in abundance two traits that I admire as much as any traits I admire in the world. He views the world with wonder and he is playful seeing that humor is a part of everything that matters in our world and that humor is not the opposite of being serious, but it is a path to being serious. In Ido, I have seen like William Blake, I personally have had the pleasure of seeing like William Blake, songs of innocence grow into songs of experience. And it has been one of the great pleasures of my life. So let me tell you a little bit about how this evening is gonna go. We are going to, over the course of this evening, hear eight short remarks, just 10 or 15 minutes each by an astonishing group of brilliant scholars and ponderers, some of whose books have rocked our worlds, rocked my worlds for years, and some young scholars who are new to all this. These talks will be divided into two sessions, and between the two sessions, we will hear from Zohar Shafir and the band Nicotine. Between the talks of our scholars, we will show short psychedelic videos carefully selected by Ido himself from the site Psychedelic Video Museum www.psychedelicvideomuseum.org, which has a vast 
library of psychedelic art and video, and it's curated by a team of 17 cognoscenti, of whom, not surprisingly, Ido is a leading light. And the hope behind this plan, the music in the middle, the videos, was that an evening celebrating American trip might best be an evening that reflects the personality of its author, brilliant, unexpected, surprising, and overflowing with light and color and music. So let's just begin this long evening with Lior Rosemann. Lior Rosemann is a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Psychedelic Research, Imperial College London, where he also got his PhD in neuroscience. Lior is currently investigating the psychosocial potential of psychedelics, mainly through investigating the potential for psychedelics of psychedelics for peace building. His remarks are called Psychedelic Peace Building, Occupation, Liberation, Messianic Consciousness, and Leary's Shadow. Lior, I don't, oh, there, I do see you. Welcome. Hey, how are you? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ido, for the invite. Uh, this is really great. Uh, very much love you, and we have like this amazing, stimulating conversation. So it's a pleasure to uh, be here and start this wonderful evening. Uh, so I've been starting to work at Imperial College seven and a half years ago, but before that, Ido was the first person I asked for advice to send me some curriculum, and he sent me some uh, great books to kind of begin my work within psychedelic research. And now I believe another book is like an uh, important part of the cu curriculum. Uh, because set and setting is the kind of main, as Ido really points strongly, is the main uh, topic or the main kind of uh, point of, uh, of amazement, actually, uh, within psychedelic research and this tension between an interaction between pharmacology and society is something that kind of creates uh, interest, I think, in the psychedelic research. And uh, so it's a pleasure to give this talk here. I started my work in uh, neuroscience and in uh, psychedelic therapy, but have moved into uh, peace research right now with psychedelics, mainly due to the flexibility that ideas just, such as set and setting allow uh, for psychedelic research and it does kind of like insisting to show this point uh, in different ways. Uh, so thank you, Ido. And I've also uh, added a link for a uh, uh, research topic in Frontiers and Pharmacology, which I'm editing, uh, which is also touches these topics and influenced by uh, Ido's uh, thinking on me. So again, thank you. So starting this work of peace building and uh, the ideas of psychedelics for maybe more systemic work or social change, there's a certain shadow of the work that I'm, uh, of this type of work as if psychedelics and social change is a direction that people uh, don't really want to touch and don't really want to go. Uh, this is the shadow of Leary, I would say. It's the history of the hippies. And there's a kind of this idea within right now the psychedelic renaissance or the kind of resurrection of psychedelics that we shouldn't fuck it up this time and this is not an anti-establishment dropout movement uh, this is a serious part of institution institutionalization and medicalization of psychedelics so any ideas of psychedelics for peace work kind of bring this history of the 60s uh, with them so I'd actually like to focus on uh, how Idol writes about Leary and two points about Leary from the book. The first one is in page 117. Uh, and these, these points would be related to my piece, uh, to the piece work that I'm doing. So in page 117, Idol describes the Concord prison experiment. Uh, this is the experiment in which Leary and other people from the Harvard group uh, give psychedelics to prisoners. And the prisoners have obviously amazing uh, psychedelic, spiritual, unitive, transcending uh, experiences, and they gain a lot of religious understanding. Uh, but then when Rick Dublin revisited the study in 1998, uh, he realized that the recidivism rates, so the rates of uh, prisoners returning to jail, uh, was pretty much the same to prisoners who did not have a psychedelic. Uh, Ido elegantly connects it to the idea of uh, Betty Eisner in her uh, paper, Set Setting and Matrix. And she's suggesting that the outcome of the psychedelic experience is very much influenced into the, uh, by the matrix or the context in which the person is returning to. So if a, per a person is turning into a challenging life context, 
uh, he might uh, return into crime as well, uh, regardless of the spiritual uh, insights he have. Uh, so this is kind of a tension in the peace uh, work that we're doing. So we started investigating Israelis and Palestinians who drink ayahuasca together. Uh, I went for a road trip with Antoine Saka, who is a Palestinian peace activist. And a few days, uh, Natalie Ginsberg from MAPS joined us. And we interviewed Israelis and Palestinians who drink together, uh, not for dialogue or not for conflict resolution or reconciliation. And they just happen to be in the same space uh, because those ceremonies are inclusive. Uh, so the Palestinians are a minority in this ceremony. Uh, but still this kind of context and the setting of the ceremony and the relational space between Israelis and Palestinians affect each other's uh, experiences. So we heard these amazing stories about harmony and union and oneness and beautiful connection and love between participants. Uh, participants reported there that uh, all identities feel Israeli, Palestinian, Jewish, uh, Arab, Muslim, Christian, all of these peel and people connect on this kind of basic uh, human spiritual level. So this is kind of an ego dissolution for the identity allows this universal connection uh, between participants. Uh, and also we heard stories of connection actually based on the other culture. So listening to Arab music is Israeli or listening to uh, Jewish Hebrew music is an Arab Palestinian. Sometimes this creates this strong intercultural connection. Uh, but there's a tension, and the tension is kind of uh, uh, one of the participants, uh, kind of the Palestinian one, summarizes it well. He says, how can I return into a checkpoint from the ceremony and say, I'm a spiritual light being, let me go through. Or he's also saying, how can you heal trauma when the trauma is ongoing? So trauma is not just of the past. There's a reality of the occupation of Palestinians. So there's a tension there. Uh, the, a lot of peace researchers are well somebody okay cool i hear somebody else uh uh speaker so please if you can mute it uh so this tension by peace researchers is known uh, some peace researchers call it the harmony of irony suggesting that creating a momentary harmony in a reality when real life injustice occurs can create a temporary illusion of equality which actually prevents change of uh, real life inequality uh, Abu Nimer, who's a peace researcher, called it the, the tension between harmony and liberation. So connecting to people and just becoming good friends uh, might prevent actually bringing the conflict into the confront, uh, in the, into the foreground, and uh, kind of discussing the need for political liberation as well. But we continued investigating and we saw that there's another undercurrent which is somewhat political in those interviews that we've seen. And this undercurrent I would call the prophetic or the messianic consciousness. And we had clues to this. So one of the Muslim participants said, uh, told us that uh, since Muhammad, there was no prophet, but now it's the time for the inner prophet. It's the time for the prophet to rise. Or another uh, queer Jewish participant asked us if we've ever seen a messianic tribe, uh, suggesting that in the ritual that they're doing, there's some kind of messianic uh, forces of change. So we'll go to this uh, meeting of uh, Leary and Ginsberg in page 105. So as may, many of you might know, there's this kind of Leary and Huxley that represent these two ideologies. Uh, so Huxley suggested that psychedelics should be given only by the elite, elite. Uh, so by the artists and scientists and politicians and philosophers, uh, what might today be called the uh, influencers. So Huxley suggested to influence by the influencers uh, while Leary wanted psychedelics for all. Uh, but he listens to Huxley advice until he meets uh, William Burroughs and uh, Allen Ginsberg in this kind of pivotal moment in history. Uh, they were already in the jungle. They tried Yahe and uh, Burroughs tell uh, th those two beats come and visit Leary. And Burroughs tell uh, uh, Leary about the curandero, about the ritual in the Amazon. And Leary gets very excited about the idea of being a curandero. And he facilitates a, a ceremony, a psychedelic ceremony for Ginsberg and for others. And Ginsberg at that moment has a challenging experience until uh, Leary comes and uh, comforts him. And then there's a, he has like this strong messianic opening. Um, I'll, I'll read from the book now. Ginsberg experience quickly soared to new messianic realms. It seems as if all the worlds of human consciousness were waiting for a messiah, he wrote, someone to take on the responsibility of being the creative God 
and seized power over the universe. And then continues, uh, Ginsburg uh, runs away naked in the apartment and kind of wants to call all the leaders, the Russian uh, Khrushchev and to call Kennedy and Mao Zedong and bring them all to the phone and say, we have these psychedelics, we can create this world peace, we can give psychedelics to everyone and all the world solution will change. Uh, but this, this is kind of the messianic energy that he brings into, into this. And from that moment on, uh, Leary and, uh, and uh, Ginsburg create this kind of pact uh, into bringing a revolution and bringing us breaking from Huxley's approach and bringing psychedelic for all. And this created a large uh, movement and a large change, or at least an important part of this um, important pivotal moment is in this movement. Uh, so in history, Ido beautifully shows how history in those moments of history affected uh, Ginsburg experience. So beside uh, Ginsburg being Jewish and therefore connected to messianic ideas, uh, the, also the moment of time is a moment of optimism and uh, the tension of the uh, nuclear bomb is actually relaxed in this period of time and the Russian uh, Kurchev is visiting the US and they're kind of building relationship. Uh, Kennedy was just elected and uh, Ginsburg feels this kind of a historical moment. So I would like to say that this is this kind of mystical turned into messianic is related to uh, the social political or the historical leaking into the experience. Uh, this is uh, also research of Moshe Idel. Uh, he uh, studies the interaction between messianic thinking and the Kabbalah and suggests once the mystic or the Kabbalistic mystic tries to unite not only with the absolute and uh, unchangeable, uh, but also with the temporal, with the historical, with the social political, then he might act on reality as well. Uh, and we see these kind of forces within our interviewees, I would call them prophetic processes or messianic. Uh, we see that people sometimes have uh, visions of, let's say, the temple, uh, the temple in the future, a temple of all religions, of all cultures, a prayer for everybody or the future in which the Temple Mount is on fire and the Israeli Palestinian flag are uh, in war uh, forever, and kind of this fire on the Temple Mount forever. Uh, and also visions of the history, which relates also to the collective conflict. So this can be visions uh, from the Nakba and the deportations of Palestinian in 48. It can be visions of the bleeding land, uh, of intergenerational cycles of war, of conflict that can come and do. And so affected by the other people in the ceremony and this kind of the political in a way leaks into a ceremony that tries to be uh, relatively apolitical. And this brings this energy in which people also, after having these visions, really try to change reality, first by changing this, the ritual in which they they're drinking ayahuasca with, and maybe then developing also loyalty to this experience and slowly trying to change this, the world as well. Uh, so it all points to that, that this is kind of something that happened to Ginsburg, and this is might something to, to happen uh, when historical context, historical thinking kind of is interacting with altered states of consciousness. We have lost you, Lior. You probably lost us. Ah, Zoom. <laughs> Ido save us. Okay, it looks like we have we have lost Lior Ido. Why don't we um, why don't we go to our video, um, and hopefully we'll while we're doing that we can find Lior again. So let's let's. Sorry, I just I just returned. Ah, where was I? When was I cut? More correctly, in what part? But my uh, uh, video stopped working. I'm not sure when. Uh, just about a, a minute ago, not very long ago, cool. after well, Moshe Yidel. Okay, cool. So I'll continue. I'll 
I'll continue with this kind of line of thought. Uh, so, oh, after Moshe Idel, not uh, a I bit after, a bit after, a bit, a bit after about the research as well and prophetic uh, processes in the in the research. You got it exactly. Okay, cool. So we kind of observe this kind of energy that's uh, is also directed for social change. I like to say that this energy might be suppressed a lot uh, within uh, within uh, psychedelic therapy, and many people would not like to discuss this and would not like to discuss this as part of their own personal process, uh, because of this kind of opened to me from the interviews. I discussed this with people, and many also confessed that this is part of their process within their kind of psychedelic practice. We've seen also people in the actually on, in therapy uh, sharing these type of experiences of uh, kind of also. Uh, social criticism and trying to change the society based of them. So I'd like to say that this kind of uh, uh, turning everything into the personal might want, might suppress this experience, uh, and and there might be there will probably be no other leery uh, in the kind of psychedelic renaissance. So there's no need to worry too much about this kind of forces. Uh, the opening happens only once, and the excitement uh, of the novelty happens only once, and the psychedelic culture is much more mature right now as hippies turned their while ago into grandparents. So if we completely suppress this intention for social change by narrowing the set and setting only for medicalization, uh, so it all kind of gives this also warning in some ways in this book that technology can be narrowed by the intention and how people use it. So if you use it only to medicalization and kind of narrow other ways of using of using it, we might find ourselves with another well-being product in which the commodified experience might be very efficient in treating individuals, but not in changing the obviously med setting in which we live in. So I believe that once the personal and the collective are more aligned, when mind liberation and political liberation are seen as two sides of the same coin, even on the therapeutic couch, then the weaving of our own stories within the unfolding history can become a possibility. So thank you. Thank you, Ido. I love you very much. Uh, thanks for the invite. Thank you, Lior. That was wonderful. That was that was fascinating. Um, now let's watch the, that video by Shmulek Kraus. Ready? 
חשיש, 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 חשיש. Okay, that was, of course, Shmule Kraus and Shishi Kham in a, a video that in its day was banned from being aired. Um, Ido, as you may have seen, is drinking a beer, which raises an important point that um, if you want to take a moment and go get something mind-altering, it's encouraged in, um, in this conference. Our next speaker, and we're delighted, is Uri Shwed. Uri Shwed is a senior lecturer in sociology at Ben-Gurion University of the Negev. His work in the sociology of science marries positivist instincts and methods with interpretive theoretical mechanisms in issues like scientific consensus formation and mind-altering social ecologies. His remarks are entitled, From American Trip to Global Experience, Symmetrically Analyzing Drug Users' Experiences. Uri. Thank you, Noach, and uh, thank you, Ido, for your kind invitation. I'm trying, I did prepare a presentation I'm trying to share. Um, yes, so hopefully you can see my uh, screen now. Um, again, thank you for this uh, invitation. It's really, really exciting for me uh, to speak amongst all these other people uh, who most of which, uh, and very directly the person speaking before and after me had a significant role in uh, my initiation as a student of these fascinating mind altering technologies. So uh, really, thank you. And my only regret is that we can't have the post-session drinks together. Um, today, I will try to follow some of Ido's leads from the book and extend some insights, broadening the scope in terms of the field of inquiry, as well as the methods used. So my title hints that I will not actually say anything about the 1960s collective setting, since Ido did such a great job of it already. Rather, the sensibilities laid in the book provide my departure point. I hope to follow some of Ido's leads and offer more global, not in the geographic sense, but in the sense of sifting over temporal and spatial settings to reveal something about the drugs as they are used in real life by real drug users. This is a work in progress conducted together with uh, Hannes Kettner from Imperial Center for Psychedelic uh, Research. And this is another opportunity to thank both Ido and Lior again for uh, making this work possible by um, enabling my visit there last year. So throughout the book, the, but most sharply as we near its end, Ido weaves several theoretical mechanisms to explain the odd history of our current understanding of psychedelics. In chapter eight, Dido presents collective set and setting and the looping effects of LSD to explain feedback loops of the substance with politics, spirituality, culture, technology. But in chapter nine, he symmetrically tears down some of our taken for granted associations of psychedelics which are the results of these feedback loops. For example, that psychedelics are sexy or pacifist. This actually, uh, this result uh, turns, turns out to be situated in a very particular time and place. In the final chapter, we get leads as to what can be done with these tools regarding other drugs, drug research and drug policy. Derrida aligns with a demarcation of positivist versus reflexive science and argues that psychedelics research could use more of the latter. He's probably right about that, but sociology, STS, and specifically the social science around mind altering technologies could perhaps do away with the turf war between positivism and reflexivity. Instead, I offer a macro view, glossing over multiple settings to employ SDS sensibilities, mainly symmetry and democratization of knowledge for an empirical exercise, which is positivist in method and reflexive in aims and data. My aims here 
are to empirically challenge the broad category of illicit drugs, to ask what, if anything, do they have in common and where should we draw the boundaries of this category? It seeks insight into why people use different substances in different ways. Crucially, it does so by investigating the knowledge users produce about drugs, so it contributes to a democratization of science. Hopefully, it would also contribute to disentangling the broad, very political category of illicit drugs into more evidence-based groupings of drug types, each requiring a different mode of control. In that respect, the project offers some robust positivist evidence to the policy recommendation Ido hints at towards the end of the book, not by focusing on set and setting necessarily, but by the sheer power of numbers calculating over different settings in different periods. Perhaps the most influential previous attempt of describing what drugs actually do to real people in their contexts is the work of David Nutt on behalf of the Independent Scientific Committee on Drugs from 2010. They developed a process evaluating drug harms based on 16 criteria. Theirs is a rational, reproducible estimation of drug harms, and their results expose the irrationality of drug scheduling, showing, for example, that alcohol is actually the most dangerous drugs, that the damage of cocaine is similar to that of tobacco, and that LSD is quite harmless. But the whole debate paid little attention to the reasons people use these substances. Are there drug benefits? Do benefits change notions of more and less dangerous drugs? The current exercise extends not at all's harm analysis by making it symmetrical in Maturian terms, uh, extending the, the axis. Uh, uh, I'm afraid I'm hearing harmful. you. Through your, uh, through your, uh, um, the are there so, benefits uh, benefits there's a delay. Is everyone with me? Signals? Yes, I think everyone's with you, but I can hear me. There's someone named. Okay, I'm sorry. So I wish to uh, make this analysis more symmetrical by extending the axis of harms with some uh, uh, relation to drug benefits and also by extending expert views with users' experiences as they are reported in the wild. And the wild here, uh, the wild here is the Airwave Vault. It is the oldest, largest, and most comprehensive online repository of independent drug information. It holds users submitted experience report that serve me as data. These reports are not a representative sample of drug use. So this does not qualify as a fully fledged uh, positivist exercise. Rather, the sample is biased towards both extremes. Very good or very bad experiences are more likely to provoke users to share and post. It is also biased towards psychedelics, which are grossly overrepresented for better and for worse. However, it remains the largest depository of drug users' experiences. And what follows relies on some 20,000 reports identified with a single main substance and at least hundreds of reports on any particular substance mentioned. Extending not et al's analysis of harms to self and harms to others, provoke me to develop the two scales illustrated here with positive scores for benefits and negative scores for harms, values in the red circle for reports that only mention direct drugs effect, drug effects, values between one and two or between minus one and minus two for benefits or harms that extend beyond the duration of the drug, such as hangovers and afterglows, and higher values for lasting changes as addiction or overcoming it, developing or getting rid of anxieties, etc. So higher values generate zones of self-destruction on the bottom left, healing on the right, and when such healing is aimed towards others or towards nature and the planet, I label it enlightenment for lack of a better term. 
crucially, these scores are based on what the texts explicitly mention and nothing else. 70 reports were selected as reference texts and manually coded according to the scheme in the previous slide. Then the word scores algorithm assigns every word in the reference text with a score and uses these scores and word probabilities to grade new texts. So that 20,000 user reports were scored, quite the Latourian manipulation of scale. These scores are presented first for 10 major substance groups outlined here and later for the specific substances in the Not at All project. Note that all groups have both legal marked in italics and illegal substances marked in bold, with the exception of two groups, delirians and psychiatric medications, where all common substances are legal. So the results, the groups are ordered here by their mean scores on harm or benefit to the user. The boxes represents the interquartile range of the distribution. The center line is the median. It's notch or waist is a confidence interval for the median. So this blue line shows that reports on psychedelics are significantly better than any other drug group. The red line shows that reports on opioids describe significantly better experience than those of psychiatric medications and worse experiences than alcohol or other GABAergic depressants and anything better than that. The dotted green line takes a tougher threshold than the significance of the mean and shows that the bottom quarter of psychedelics reports show a better score than the 75th percentile of delirients, opioids, and stimulants. I have an equivalent graph for harms and benefits to the others. It looks very, very similar. So I'll skip it for now. Now, how do these compare to uh, not at all's exercise? Uh, next, I will show you uh, score means for specific substances. This is also important because when we deal with substance groups, we bring in a lot of noise from esoteric substances and novel research chemicals that very few users experiment with. And these bring more negative reports to all groups. So the next and final figure deals with the specific common drugs that not at all investigated, ignoring for now tobacco and four other substances for technical reasons. So let's try and unpack this loaded figure. The x-axis lists the substances from the worst in the left to the least harmful in the right as found by not at all. If the results are completely coherent, we would expect to see a clear rising trend from left to right. Differences from such trend may stem from the bias of an extremes oriented sample or from differences in the weighing of harms to others and harms to the user. Or more interestingly, from the differences of expert and user voices or from the consideration of drug benefits. These differences from left to right are first that alcohol here isn't the worst. Its position is between amphetamine and cannabis. Then heroin, crack cocaine and cocaine show no significant differences between them while not at all found cocaine to be much less harmful than heroin or crack cocaine. Cannabis switch places with GHB and most clearly ephedrone, methadone and buprenorphine all greatly underscore here. Beyond the comparison with not at all through the x-axis, the combined scores of the two measures offer further insights. Consider this red bar marking the confidence interval of the median for ketamine showing it is indistinguishable from ecstasy, but significantly lower from the green bar for LSD. On the other hand, the gray bar for the confidence interval of cocaine's median is not different from heroin or crack cocaine. A more robust finding, not about the median, but about the entire interquartile range shows itself when we mark this range for ketamine in yellow and cocaine in pink. The central half of reports in the ketamine scores distribution 
covers most of the interquartile range of ecstasy, LSD, and psilocybin mushrooms. And the medians of ephedrine and cannabis are also within that range. Pink marks the interquartile range of cocaine, very similar to that of crack cocaine and heroin, and a little less so to methamphetamine and the two controlled opioid medicines. Alcohol and GHB, as well as amphetamines, do not rest well with either of these groups. While almost all of the scores distribution of all three is below zero, their distributions are not as grim as those of the other stimulants and opioids. The most positive reports in the interquartile range of D3 are at the yellow range, similar to the bottom of the ecstasy and even the LSD distribution. But the negative reports of these are at the pink range, more akin to the better heroin, cocaine, and meth reports. So to sum up, analyzing 20,000 users' experiences gives unprecedented breadth as well as novel methods to the life worlds of drug use. These are not one world. The top three quarters of reports on opioids, stimulants, or psychiatric medicine get lower scores than the bottom quarter of reports on psychedelics. Dissociatives and empathogens with their array of novel research chemicals do reach the score range of opioids and stimulants, but focusing on the most common substances shows two clear groups. Drugs that generate positive reports such as ketamine, ecstasy, and LSD, and drugs that generate negative reports such as cocaine and heroin. Alcohol, amphetamines, GHB, and to a lesser degree also cannabis and amphetron, chagigat, offer a third world between the previous two. Current control modes have unfortunately very little to do with the way users experience drugs. The two distinct social worlds both contain legal, controlled, and illegal substances. Take the opioid substitute methadone, for example, scored as less harmful than ketamine by the experts, but shows itself here as similar to heroin. Not at all are not wrong that methadone is far less harmful than heroin. They just ignore the benefits that users get from heroin. Only by factoring in symmetrically the benefits that users seek can we account for the ongoing use in dangerous substances. When we do so, we discover that some of these substances' benefits overwhelm their potential harms. According to Nad et al., LSD has some potential harm to the user with a score of seven. But considering its possible benefits, it becomes clear that this is by far a better substance than tobacco, alcohol, or Prozac. Trying to explain the empirically two distinct drug worlds, all I have is interpretation and my own contemplation. But consider that in one of these worlds, we have opioids, which offer a relief from the agonies of reality. We have stimulants that offer maybe some secret bullet for handling reality better. And we have whatever psychiatry has to offer for balance and adaptation. Perhaps this world, often leading to addiction and otherwise bad experiences, is about adaptation. Now, it would be too easy to argue that the other world is about consciousness expansion. And it would also be wrong because empathogens only change one's feelings and dissociatives merely change one's viewpoint. But perhaps this is the one thing that these three groups in this positive social world share, a change of perspective. Maybe what drug users are telling us is that attempting to adapt to our current society is rough and dangerous. And periodically changing our viewpoint can be beneficial and pleasant. Thank you. Thank you. And here, here, attempting to adapt to our present society can be rough and dangerous. I agree. Um, now let us see a video uh, by Oritor.
cool. That was Oritor and Vial of Sound. Once again, all of these videos are available at www.psychedelicvideomuseum.org. Next up is the singular, remarkable Yahav Erez. Yahav Erez studies psychedelics as a medium constructed as any other technology is constructed. Part of this construction is the formation of local knowledge regarding safe and beneficial use of psychedelics. And Yav has lately studied harm reduction initiatives at festivals in which he has been both a volunteer and a researcher. Yahav trained in media studies in Sapir College and STS at Bar Ilan University, where she had the brilliant luck of having her work supervised by Ido. And I had the brilliant luck of being able to work both with Yahav and Ido as a co-supervisor. Yahav is a founder of the Israel chapter of Students for Sensible Drug Policy and of Toda'a Rabah, the first psychedelic podcast in Hebrew. She has other podcasts that you want to listen to as well if you check them out. She's also one of the seven editors of the Daily Psychedelic Video website. The title of her remarks is stay at home and trip, recreational use in times of a pandemic. Timely, Yav. Hi everybody, um, am I able to share the screen? I need to be the host for you that. You the host. Uh, in the meantime, you are a I'll give you a, uh, great, thank you. In the meantime, I'll give you a nice anecdote about what we just saw. Uh, I actually didn't even know that Oritol had videos. I had discovered this amazing artist on Instagram while I was sharing uh, psychedelic art on our uh, on our podcast Instagram account. And uh, we started chatting and he said, oh, I've heard of your podcast. It's really interesting. And somehow we got to talking about um, the fact that he had never even tried psychedelics, which I was very surprised about. It's always very uh, surprising to find out that such psychedelic artists that have these, you know, you know, these such vibrant psychedelic visuals um, that they create, actually, you don't necessarily have to try out psychedelics to be a psychedelic entity or a psychedelic artist, apparently. Um, so yeah, that was that was a pleasant surprise when I just saw this video and I looked familiar and I checked it out and I saw, yeah, that's the, that's the same artist. So um, I'll start with my presentation. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for being here and especially Ido, who was uh, my thesis research supervisor and uh, Noah as well together. Um, I couldn't have asked for better supervisors. Uh, I really feel like I'm part of some, uh, I, I might even say some lineage since uh, Noah was the supervisor for Ido's uh, PhD dissertation. And then Ido was the supervisor for my dissertation. And I really feel privileged to have these two amazing teachers uh, be part of part of my learning process. So thank you very much. And I also want to give a special thanks to uh, Tsipi Lazar Shoef, who's also a PhD candidate in the Science, Technology, and Society Studies program at Bar Ilan University. She is a data whiz and helped me a lot with the graphs and the analysis uh, that I will be showing you right now. Um, I'm going to start with uh, this meme that I came across a few uh, weeks ago, and it really threw me back to Ido's last chapter of his book, um, The Future of Set and Setting, because I thought of, you know, how much I've learned from reading Ido's research and his book and his, you know, his articles that he's published and how, you know, I've used these tools of understanding, the new understanding of set and setting through his writing and his ideas and learning to apply them about how I think about our current use of psychedelics and specifically the recreational use because that's uh, my main interest. And um, when, I'm, when I read about the past of psychedelic uh, use, recreational use, 
um, that Ido was talking about and you know the, the decades up until the 21st century, I immediately thought about you know the past year that we've been through and how that's changed the set and setting not only of you know our life generally but specifically of the psychedelic experience since now festivals and raves, which were you know a very popular place to use psychedelics in a recreational way, are not really existent anymore. Um, and it led me to formulate this questionnaire, which I handed out to uh, a few people. And I'm going to show you a few of the ideas that came up uh, from the analysis. So I'll start with, you know, just plain numbers. Um, the questionnaire was answered by a sample of 164 people, uh, all of which were Israelis. So this is a very specific sample, not very uh, representative of the whole world, but in a sense, the whole world, you could say, is going through a very similar process with this pandemic. So maybe we'll be able to learn a little bit. Um, as you can see, when asked if they have used psychedelics before April 2020, which was the line that I drew of before and after pandemic, um, most of the people had used it. Uh, other than 3.5%, everybody had used it once or more which means that the sample is relatively experienced users, you could say. Um, and when asked if they have used psychedelics since then, uh, not only have most of them answered that they have, but 45.3% had answered yes more than three times, which was kind of surprising to me since we're talking about around eight or nine months at this point. Uh, two lockdowns here in Israel, um, and it was pretty surprising that people chose to go on these uh, explorations uh, during this very weird and confusing time. I'm going to jump into these numbers a little deeper. Uh, when asked, the people that answered that they hadn't tried psychedelics before the pandemic, uh, some people answered that they had tried it for the first time during the pandemic, and that is especially interesting, even though these numbers are very low, it would be very interesting to hear about these people's reports, uh, what it's like to try it for the first time and be introduced into the psychedelic experience while having a worldwide pandemic be your set and setting. Um, from within the people who answered that they had tried psychedelics once or twice beforehand, there were not a lot of people who wanted to or who had tried psychedelics during the pandemic. And I'm assuming that that has something to do with the inexperience, uh, relatively inexperienced, um, kind of leading to an uncertainty and you know, uh, maybe anxiety or fear of you know, going into these kinds of uh, experiences. Um, and like I said before, the people who, who are a little more experienced, who had done it more than twice before the pandemic, were obviously the ones who were less afraid, who were more prone to, you know, use it and not only use it, but apparently three times or more, as you can see here. Um, also, it's important to say these are numbers and not percentages. So just so you know that. Uh, when asked why not, why the people who decided not to try uh, the psychedelic experience while during a pandemic, um, the questions vary, the, the answer is varied, but um, I kind of saw a few themes, mainly the fear of, uh, you know, the world being different, unfamiliar, unknown, feeling like maybe having this kind of experience could lead to bad places, um, a feeling, you know, kind of, it's harder to get your hands on psychedelics, um, people wanting to do it out in nature or, you know, in an open space, but the lockdowns being an obstacle to that, which I can very much understand. Um, and other reasons as well, um, basically coming down to the right set and setting did not occur, which was, you know, a very wide way to say the, the certain things that someone needed to, to feel secure and feel comfortable weren't part of the reality at that point. 
Another thing that was interesting to me, obviously, was which substances uh, these people decided to use, the ones that answered that they had experienced psychedelics during the pandemic. And uh, I don't find these numbers surprising very much. I could assume that these were the numbers, and it looks pretty, pretty accurate to the uh, Israeli audience, according to what I've researched beforehand about the recreational use of psychedelics. But obviously you can see here that the psilocybin is winning. Um, there could be a few guesses to why. Um, maybe you, if you want to share a few of your guesses in the chat, uh, you're welcome to. When asked with whom the trip was you know, taking place, um, a lot of people did it with one other person, either together, both, on psychedelics or with a sitter, meaning one person was on was under the influence and the other was not, was there just to you know, kind of make sure everything was okay. And uh, people did it with a few other people, but there was also a, a quite a percentage that did it that decided to do it alone, um, maybe because they were alone at home or maybe because they just felt that that was you know the atmosphere that they were getting used to at that time. Some more guesses would uh, be welcomed as well in the chat if you feel like it. What was uh, very interesting to me was where, where it was done. So as you can see, 32% in nature, 35% inside a home, in someone's home. Uh, what was interesting was the 17% that still did it in a festival or a rave, obviously not the big, you know, the large festivals that we're used to every summer in Israel, um, probably more underground, uh, illegal, small raves in, out in nature. But uh, this kind of reminded me about how Israelis don't really follow the rules. Uh, and even during a uh, pandemic, they might go and organize a party for them and a few friends and uh, even want to go on a psychedelic experience at that party. Um, so, and also this is probably in between the two lockdowns that uh, we have experienced here in Israel and during March and during September, October. Um, so I'm assuming sometime in between the lockdowns, but I don't know, maybe, maybe during the lockdowns as well. Um, so a little bit of demographics, the ages of the people that answer this questionnaire uh, ranged from 20 to 67. Most of the people were between the ages of 27 and 31. Uh, I want to mention that this sample is obviously, you know, not very representative to all the users of psychedelics in Israel. Uh, it's more, you know, the closer circles to me and what I could get to, but um, these are the ages. A few more demographics. Uh, I found it extra interesting that there were still 20% that had children and still went on a psychedelic uh, journey, which, uh, which is admirable if you ask me, because I mean, people with children who don't have any school to go to and are at home all day, uh, probably have to you know, make a little more of an effort to curate or like facilitate such a space for them to, uh, to go on this psychedelic journey. Um, a few reports that I noticed from people sharing their thoughts and experiences were very uh, touching and moving and uh, interesting. People shared something that was borderline trip reports and uh, reading, the, really going over them was a really special experience. Um, I'm just gonna bring a few examples of what people were sharing. Um, the, a lot of, a lot of talk about the opposition to the chaos that's going you know, outside in the outside world um, and how the use of psychedelics was bringing inner peace and tranquility into the inside world, which is something that we know about you know, use of psychedelics uh, throughout history and not, not just now during the pandemic. But what's interesting is that uh, when people are using psychedelics less in raves and festivals and more, you know, at home alone or out in nature or, you know, just with a few friends in, in a more like quiet environment, um, this might also have an influence on the, ex on the inner experience. So usually at a festival where there's a lot of chaos and, and noise and celebration and a lot of that kind of energy, um, 
the the use it really it really influences the use that kind of set and setting. Uh, some people reported that they didn't have such a different experience because of uh, because of the pandemic, but they did um, have uncomfortable experiences or stressful experiences, just like uh, this example of someone getting a fine from the police, being fined while uh, using acid, while under the influence of acid, which sounds terribly stressful. And um, I, I can really understand how not wanting to use psychedelics because in you know non-COVID times, it was an illegal activity and now it's an extra illegal activity because not only are you not supposed to be using these substances, but you're not supposed to be outside or you're not supposed to be congregating in any way. So that could be some more anxiety uh, that people feel and maybe prevents them from using it altogether. Uh, some people even talked about how the experience was a little more difficult for them because of the all the change going on in the world, um, their hesitance, you know, to go out on this journey, and um, the you know social political discourse that came up, you know, within the group that they were with or within the, the other people that they were with, and mainly the the need to create this intimacy um, in in this, this togetherness as in opposition to the separateness that was going on everywhere around us and how you know the, the regular need for, for togetherness and the regular need for human connection maybe even you know, became larger, you know, stronger during these times. Uh, some people felt like you know, it was helping them cope with the situation, um, especially during these times. Um, and one quote that really, really moved me um, was someone that said that maybe there was an element of happiness about not being able to break the human spirit. And these words just really yelled out to me from the, uh, from the Excel sheet, because not being able to break the human spirit, I think, is, is very central to uh, these experiences of, you know, even during a time of a pandemic and even during a time when even you know leaving your house uh, in certain times can be illegal people still choose to embark on these journeys they still choose to explore their consciousness um, they don't give up this you know kind of right this given right this human right as i see it to explore their own minds and their own you know souls um, and this took me back to uh, that last chapter that Ido wrote about the future of set and setting because we're not really sure if this is going to be the set and setting from now on. And as someone who researched the support, the psychedelic peer support that um, initiatives have been providing in festivals and raves, um, it's, I'm wondering what kind of support can we give each other during these times and what might be, you know, what, a long time uh, and how how the support would change might might change and how the needs might change during these times. Um, and generally, just to end, I, I really hope that um, we all, you know, keep our spirits up uh, with or without psychedelics and uh, the feeling of not being able to break the human spirit. Um, I hope it stays with each one of us. Um, from now until until we can go back to having you know our festivals and raves. Okay. Thank you very much. We thank you, Yav. You're an inspiration. Really appreciate it. Ido, the video. Israel במצב פסיכוטי. ומה שהיא צריכה זה טיפול הוליסטי. הצטרפו למפלגת הגאולה, המפלגה היחידה שנותנת לכם את מה שאתם רוצים עכשיו, לא אחרי הבחירות, בזמן הבחירות. מפלגת הגאולה מציעה את האנטיוויוס הקוסמי לישראל 2009 לקיום הרמוני בעולם כאוטי. הדרך היחידה לשרוד היא דרך הנדיבות האינסופית, כל דבר אחר הוא... ישראל במצב פסיכוטי, 
ומה שהיא צריכה זה טיפול הוליסטי. הצטרפו למפלגת הגאולה, המפלגה היחידה שנותנת לכם את מה שאתם רוצים עכשיו, לא אחרי הבחירות, בזמן הבחירות. מפלגת הגאולה מציעה את האנטיוויוס הקוסמי לישראל 2009 לקיום הרמוני בעולם כאוטי. הדרך היחידה לשרוד היא דרך הנדיבות האינסופית, כל דבר אחר הוא התאבדות. ב-2009 מבטלים את האגו, כי צריך להבין שכולם הם אליהו הנביא. אנחנו דורשים מחברי הכנסת, הכניסו צלם במשכן! ואנחנו דורשים מראש הממשלה הבאה שיעמיד את עצמו וייוולד מחדש בצלבו של האל כעבדו של הטוב לעולם ולעולמי עד OED והצטרפו לברית הקשרים הברית של האנשים שלוקחים אחריות על החיים שלהם ובוחרים בטוב I love that video so much. If there are any um, people who are considering going to graduate school, I recommend that you include that in your application process packet, as Ido didn't do, but I remember all the faculty, we found it, and I remember all of us looking, thinking, oh, yeah, we, we need this student. We need this student. Look how far it will get you. Our next speaker is Dr. Tomer Pirsiko. Um, Tomer Pirsiko is the Korot Visiting Assistant Professor at the University of California at Berkeley a senior research scholar at the Berkeley Center for Middle Eastern Studies and the Shalom Hartman Institute Bay Area Scholar in Residence. Persigo's fields of study are contemporary spirituality, Jewish modern identity, Jewish renewal, and forms of secularization and religiosity in Israel. His first book, The Jewish Meditative Tradition in Hebrew was published by Tel Aviv University Press. And his second book, Examining how the idea of the image of God has influenced modern Western civilization will be published in Israel by Yidiot soon. He is a public intellectual of warmth, insight, decency, and power and influence because he is closely followed on social media, pretty much universally admired, and I don't think I would know what to think without him. His remarks will be called The Ethics of Consciousness, the Normative Element in our set and setting. Tomer. Thank you so much, Noah. And I, I first of all want to say how thrilled I am to be here and how excited I am that Ido's book is finally out and we can talk about it. And I mean, con I consider Ido a friend and I admire him and it's just a joy um, to see this book out, to read it. And, and really, I would like to even follow up on, on what was said here, but ask, ask a, a big question about it. I mean, uh, um, um, sorry, I, I, um, I forgot, uh, Uri, right. Uri talked about beneficial use of, uh, of substances and uh, Yahav, right, talked about therapeutic use. But I want to ask if in a fundamental way, what is beneficial? What are we, uh, what, what do we consider good? and proper and beneficial in a state of mind. And what, when we talk about therapeutics, what, are, what is our goal? What is our telos? What are we heading to uh, uh, rectify in ourselves? And I would like to suggest that really the last dimension that, that remains maybe arguably to be morally mapped in our society is the mind. I mean, we've mapped uh, uh, ethically, love, we've ethically mapped war, politics, uh, economics. We know what's good and bad or have ideas, have articulated ideas about what's good and bad in any of those fields. And we know the goals, we know how to get to them. We know the proper and improper ways to get to certain goals. Does the end justify the means? Does it not, etc. We know what we're talking about. And here, when we're talking about consciousness, suddenly we have some ideas Though I would suggest in Western modern society, no articulate, defined ways of understanding, of explaining to ourselves what we want, why we want it, and what's a proper way to get to it. What's a normative, really, what's an ethical normative 
state of mind. What's a good state of mind? And let me give you an example. I can drink five cups of coffee easily. I can then uh, swallow a bottle of whiskey. I can then uh, um, uh, smoke and uh, inhale nicotine and, uh, into my blood system. I can then swallow a couple of tylen Tylenols in order to uh, maybe a, a alleviate my throbbing headache. And I can do all this perfectly legally. There's no problem, but I can't take a pill of Ritalin if I want to concentrate a bit better or swallow Prozac if I want to, let's say, relax or, or uh, calm down my anxiety unless I get a prescription from a doctor. Now, what is the logic in the sequence that I have just described. There is no coherent way to explain why I can ingest this drug, but cannot ingest Ritalin unless I am permitted to do so by a me medical professional. And what gives a doctor the permission or the authority to have such hold, have such authority on my consciousness and on the things I can use to change my state of consciousness. I would say nothing except for the law. And the law is there because we, as a society, have not articulated a certain understanding of the ethics of consciousness, of how to appreciate, how to evaluate good or negative states of mind and to act accordingly. Let's give another example. Um, perhaps you've heard of a certain medicine called modafinil. Modafinil is a treatment for narcolepsy. Narcolepsy is a problem with your on and off switch for sleep. People that are suffering from narcolepsy can, can fall asleep during active, uh, during active life. So obviously this is very dangerous if you're driving and suddenly you're asleep. Uh, what modafinil does is keeps you awake basically simply keeps you awake. Now it keeps you awake if you're suffering from narcolepsy, but it also keeps you awake if you're not. If, you're, uh, if you have no problem with your on and off sleep switch, then it can keep you awake for up to three days. Now, this is a prescription drug, but why is it so? Do we have some problem with people taking modafinil as much as they want? Right, let's say it doesn't have side effects. And even if it does, that's, that's a question in itself, but let's say it doesn't, okay? Can modafinil be situated on the um, pharmacy shelf for anyone to take? Would we like students who are cramming for a test to be able to take it? Would we like truck drivers to be able to take it? Would we like our chief of staff during war to be able to take it. We need to answer in each case why we would or why we wouldn't through some sort of ethics of consciousness, which again, we have not articulated for ourselves. Uh, I'm going to bring a quote from Ido's uh, wonderful book. Uh, Ido tells about Timothy Leary and, um, uh, and uh, uh, Robert Alper uh, in, in Harvard, and this is a quote, Harvard admit, and they were of course experimenting with LSD and Harvard administrators were perhaps being acutely perceptive, says Ido, writes Ido, when they reportedly told, told Leary and Alpert upon their dismissal, quote, you may be making Buddhas out of everyone, but that's not what we're trying to do. Now, they were right. As Ido says, they were perceptive, right? Harvard is not trying to make Buddhas out of people. Leary and Alpert were, and that's not the place to do it. But that raises the question, why not? Is becoming a Buddha good or bad? And what does Harvard actually want to achieve from LSD? Perhaps Harvard thinks that LSD is a, is a medicinal, substance that needs to be relegated, regulated inside a, 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 a therapeutic context. That's one answer. But even so, I would suggest no in-depth thought has been given to the question, what actually do we want to gain at the end? What, in other words, is 
a good state of mind. Because at the end, what I'm trying to get at is that this is not a medical question. This is an ethical question. And the, uh, uh, and the question is not who is allowed to prescribe which drug and not. The question is, A, as I just said, what is a proper, what is the good, what is a worthy state of mind? And the next question is, what are good, worthy, and proper ways to achieve that state of mind? Because obviously we might think that a certain state of mind is good, proper, worthy, but you can't simply achieve it through any means possible. So these are the questions that we need to answer. And what I'm uh, saying is that we have not articulated any substantial answer for these questions in modern Western society. Now, as I said before, we do still have some unarticulated idea. We do still uh, act according to some normative demands. And these demands, I would want to suggest, uh, we have inherited really, again, unconsciously even, from our Western modern traditions, from two basic uh, grand traditions of, uh, of the enlightenment and of romanticism. Enlightenment gives us a certain Again, unarticulated ethics of consciousness because it portrays a certain type of person. A human has to uh, act according to certain principles. They have to be autonomous. They have to be serious. They have to be concentrated, focused. They have to control themselves and they have to control basically their surroundings, right? They shouldn't lose control. They shouldn't lose focus. And they basically need to be an elder, uh, uh, an adult going through life in a calculated way. Now, that's a certain view of what a human is. And I would suggest that for much of Western society today, that view unconsciously uh, directs their uh, relationship with narcotic substances of any kind. So that's why grass was illegal for a long time. It doesn't contribute to your concentration and focus. And LSD certainly, same as that, does not. Uh, while coffee does and uh, is legal uh, accordingly. The other view, which is less pronounced, but still exists in our society is somewhat of the uh, negative of the enlightenment view. And this is the romantic view, the romantic view that views man not as a, a consciousness-based creature, but as a will or energy-based creature. So our center of being is not the mind, not our thoughts, not our memory and our capacity to calculate uh, uh, you know, long form uh, division, but our main, our essence is feeling, emotion, is uh, creativity, is authenticity. Things that come not from the mind, but quite the opposite maybe when the mind is put on hiatus, put on hold and something else is allowed to flow freely through us as it were. This version of the human, of a person, also informs our attitude towards drugs, though it informs that from the grassroots level, I would say, not from the uh, institutional level. So lawmakers aren't so happy about that view, but of course the counterculture adopted, adopted that view and, and uh, performed itself accordingly, according to the view that we must release ourselves from the shackles of mind and thought, etc., and let our creativity flow. That's, now that, these two views, again, unconsciously and unarticulatedly inform what we think is a good or negative state of consciousness. But what about the second question? What about how to get to that state of consciousness? Here again, we have some unarticulated views that I think we must, uh, we, must, we must be aware of. 
And I would, and, and, and if you, I mean, if you think about the negative um, approach to ingesting drugs, I think it is pretty clear that uh, there are, I would suggest two main reasons people shy away or people look negatively upon the use of drugs. One is very simple, is, the, is basically the Protestant work ethic. Uh, a person should be given what he or she um, uh, is, is um, forgot the word in English, is, is, is what, what, whatever they, um, whatever they made some Good. effort in order to get, whatever they are worthy of getting, not, there's no free lunches in life. So if you, if, so uh, the use of drug is sort of circumscribing uh, that effort that you must, you must uh, give in order to get something. And the second is the very modern understanding of ourselves, of our, our me, our ego as an autonomous um, will, a based entity that is of itself, that is cut off from its surroundings, that can control its surroundings when it wishes, but that, uh, that anything that it doesn't do by itself, it, in, or any, anything it can't control is something that should be, um, should be taken with some apprehension, should be should be suspicious of not being totally real or even sometimes being dangerous. So if I exert some effort and, um, and will and accomplish something by itself, it doesn't only fulfill a Protestant work ethic, it also fulfills a fundamental understanding of myself about myself. This is part of me, this is really mine. And if something from outside comes and influences me by uh, not totally by my control, this is something that I should be suspicious of. It's something that, right, I should, I should maybe uh, even disallow for, uh, for the majority of people. Um, this, this again are basically our views today that, again, as I said, are coming from a, a very unarticulated place, a very unaware place that we are almost automatically um, subscribing to. And while that is the case, I will say that this is perhaps a rare sort of civilization, our civilization, that has not articulated an ethics of consciousness. Because if you look along history, and Ido brings some very nice um, allusions to it, almost any civilization did articulate, did describe a certain view of what is a good state of consciousness and what is a negative state of consciousness, and then of the ways to achieve those states of consciousness. And I'm talking about, of course, on, on all sorts of traditions we, which we will today call religious, right? So the shamans in uh, Siberia or, or the Yucatan desert, or, and it can be the priests of the Maya, it can be uh, um, even the Hasidic masters of uh, 18th century Eastern Europe, they had a certain view of what a good state of consciousness is and how to achieve it. Really today, operating almost on automatic pilot, on the inheritance that we have, uh, 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 that we got from the enlightenment and the romantic traditions, we are the exception in not actually articulating a proper understanding, in my view, of the in ethics of consciousness. I think what is fantastic about Isdaw's book is that Idaw takes great care to articulate the specific setting that I quote, unique cultural and time dependent understanding, end of quote from Idaw's book, of the rise of LSD and the phenomenon of LSD 
in the 60s. LSD in the 60s developed in a specific time and place and as such was influenced by that setting, by that social setting that it was developed inside, uh, in. And, and, and again, Ido brings fantastic examples how that was not in any way predetermined. It, uh, LSD does not in any way have to uh, be given the qualities that it was given in the 60s, let's say, um, peace and love inducing, right? To, to, to make it a cliche. It doesn't have to be that way. And it was that way because it was in a specific setting. To, to end my, my, my few words, I want to read from uh, the day before yesterday's paper. This is the New York Times. I don't know if you see it, right? This is Sunday, November 8th. Uh, and uh, in the elections, many things happened. Among them, that many states, many more states in the US legalized grass and marijuana, and uh, the state above us, I'm in California right now, Oregon basically decriminalized all drugs. So even heroin and cocaine, it's not legal, but if you get caught with a small amount, it's okay. And what Oregon also did is, I'm reading, uh, uh, is in, or I, I don't can't find the quote, but basically what Oregon also did is, uh, is establish laws for the establishment of dispensaries of psychedelics. So you will now be able to legally purchase LSD in Oregon as you can in California right now, legally purchase grass. And I want to read a quote by Michael Pullen uh, the author of How to Change Your Mind and a very famous uh, scholar of the uh, topic, if I'm not mistaken, right? Uh, and he says this, the image of psychedelics was closely tied to the counterculture and Timothy Leary. Now, when people think about psychedelics, many of them think about psychotherapy. They think about healing. And that's the reason he gives for the change in uh, the change, the legal change, the change, the fact that in the elections, in the in these elections, uh, psychedelics got a green card, uh, uh, um, an affirmative uh, reaction from the majority of the voters because it is considered a healing substance. That's fantastic, but I will end with the question: Yet we need to articulate clearly what we mean by healing, where are we going, what we want our consciousness to become, and how is it legitimate and positive to achieve such a state. That is what we still do not have and awaits articulating. Thank you. Thank you, Tomer. That was wonderful. Um, we are now moving on to, um, to our entertainment portion of the evening to uh, to Nico Teen, which is a, a band that a few years back, Haaretz called a singular presence that hints at the echoes of gentle possibilities while preserving its pugnacity, which uh, could be said about some a lot of the people that we just heard as well. Um, and so Ido, I don't know exactly how this happens technically, and maybe you'll tell us. Yeah, I think we're starting now. I'm letting them know right now there, there's some uh, technical apparatus happening and they're supposed to go on just now. Great. And I will say that um, that at 8.30 local time in, in Israel, um, we will be back in, for a panel of American scholars. Um, and, and European ones. And your American and European scholars. And... So we'll be delighted to continue then.
תודה רבה. Wonderful, that, that was Nico Teen playing My Sharona and Satisfaction and then all the rest. That was wonderful. I understand that some people had trouble hearing and I'm sorry because uh, for those of us that heard and saw, it was quite spectacular. Welcome back to everyone who might have stepped away to get a beer or some wine or something else. And welcome to our 
new participants from the United States and from Europe. We'll begin our second session with Eric Davis. Eric Davis is a writer, scholar, teacher, podcaster, and award-winning journalist based in San Francisco. His wide-ranging work focuses on the interaction of alternative religion, media, and the popular imagination. He is the author most recently of the wonderful book, High Weirdness, Drugs, Esoterica, and Visionary Experience in the 70s. He earned a PhD in religion at Rice University in 2015, and the title of his remarks is Setting Up, Set, and Setting. Eric, welcome. Hey, it's wonderful to be here. This is great. This is a great moment. You know, I've, uh, you know, when, you, when I, when I meet people, I often know within like literally like five seconds, whether they're, they're going to be really good friends. And, and this is what happened to me. And I, I suspect many of you, when I met Ido and, uh, you know, and so I got to hear about the genesis of this book and his work and also just got to know him as a person. And I'm really happy to see that as he's achieved more scholarly success and found himself a stable position and produced a, an impressive uh, monograph that, he, that he's toned down his, uh, his uh, psychedelic cultural dimension and everything is very uh, you know, neat and uh, tidy here. Actually, I was very happy because I was like, I didn't really, you know, I didn't write out anything. And I was just like, oh, I'm just gonna talk about, you know, oh wait, there's all these other scholars that might be kind of an uptight scene. And I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> Welcome in. Anyway, so I'm, I'm, you know, for me, set, set and setting is like the most interesting part of, uh, or the most interesting object to consider in terms of the anthropology, sociology, psychology, and cultural expression of psychedelics. It's the part of the psychedelic uh, culture, if you will, uh, uh, that is that should be the most interesting to everybody, even if you're not interested in psychedelics, because it's it, it provides a way to think about this issue of constructionism, which is such an important part of so many humanities disciplines in so many ways, but it does it in a, in a, in a kind of different framework. Uh, or or it, it elaborates it or it or it uh, gestures towards it, you know, in a different way. And one of the things I dealt with in, in high weirdness was a, a kind of tension between two different modes of constructionism. We sort of have a, a now rather widespread and often somewhat superficial gesture of social constructionism, where any sort of description or essence or identification or uh, you know language move is sort of seen as well that's just socially constructed as if to say it doesn't really exist and therefore it's it may be a mask of something else or uh, a mere illusion or uh, ideology et cetera et cetera and you know obviously that's a very useful kind of kind of critique but it tends to obscure what to me is a more interesting problem of constructionism uh, which has to do with the fact that, yeah, well, we might be constructing all these things, but once they're constructed, they have their own agency or they have their own consistency or they begin to actually impact uh, reality. And so the difference between constructing a mere ideology and constructing a bridge isn't quite as different as a lot of times we hear in social constructionism. So that's an interesting tension for me that's going on with the questions of psychedelics. So then you get into set and setting and you go, wow, okay, I'm interested in constructionism, the idea that the surface effect or the phenomena is actually worked behind the scenes, that it's set up in advance by some kind of template that maybe we're not aware of. This is a sophisticated, you know, sociological kind of critique. And yet we find in the history of psychedelics and particularly in the history of LSD, right there, front and center, not quite from the get-go, but almost from the get-go, the acknowledgement that something like this recursive constructionism is going on in the phenomena and that it has to be accounted for in some way or another. Uh, and so it, it can be accounted for as an attempt to avoid it uh, by maintaining sort of the, the, uh, the ideals of, uh, uh, you, you know, of a, of a, of a traditional approach to scientific 
um, procedures. You know, Nicholas talks a lot about this, and I won't, I won't go into it. Uh, hopefully, he'll he'll illuminate more with his um, marvelous approach to these uh, you know questions of how sort of psychedelics kind of gum up the works in terms of understanding what a drug is and how drug action can be understood, but. At the same time as you have this as a kind of scientific problem, as people trying to understand what is this compound, what does this compound do, are those the same questions? You also have the the looping of the concept of set and setting into this into the counterculture, where it inevitably takes on a more creative and productive kind of character. So it's already we're already in a very interesting place in terms of set and setting. And I'll just say a little bit more about the countercultural thing. I think one of the, the really, really significant lines in the history of the idea of set and setting, both before Leary and after Leary, is in the psychedelic experience, the book that, that Leary, Alfred, and Metzner wrote and published in 1964, where it's, and it's kind of buried towards the end, where he says like, well, you know, the fact that the set and setting stuff works, or it's in play, you know, it's, it's in motion, and, and in some sense, there's no way out, which is another interesting factor of it, uh, allows us to conceive of the idea of programming psychedelic experiences. Well, now we're in something very interesting because we're no longer in a critical gesture where we, after the fact, analyze some experience or some framework or some diagnostic criteria or some particular experimental protocol as itself being a force of construction. Instead, we're going, great, let's construct. But then where are we? What are we doing? What's the criteria? Uh, and so the fact that, that Ido both gives us a history of the development of this concept, which is totally key, and then wonderfully deploys it in the very history itself as a way of showing these multiple constructions, um, it's just a marvel. It's just a total, it's both a treat and it's so accessible that I, it's, I really hope that people outside of scholarship read it because it seems to me that that really taking on board the the kind of question of, of set and setting is where the responsibility and the ethics and the politics really kick in with psychedelics and i'll just say one more point on that and you know i don't want to go on too much but i was just sort of flipping through the book again and thinking about you know current issues uh and i i think i come back pro pro right now to the politics, to the idea of there being something inherently political or politically effective about psychedelic experience. And so here we flash back on the story that Ido tells about the, uh, we could call the protean quality of LSD. LSD is a proteus, uh, especially in its first three decades. It's a, it's a truth serum, it's an erotic drug, it's a psychotomimetic, uh, it's a it's an, a form of, of Christian grace. And then politically, you can see simultaneously the idea that it is an agent of counter revolution, i.e. something put in the water, perhaps by the intelligence agencies in order to take a, pol a potentially violent political uprising, mass uprising of the of the, the late 60s and denude it. And, and twist it into interior experience as a way to diffuse the energy. And at the same time, you have the weather men or the un weather underground uh, actively using this as a way to break down all of the inherent dogmatic, ideologically programmed attitudes towards subjectivity and, and sexuality and ownership and whatever, where it's the revolutionary drug. Okay, so that's already you know, wackadoodle. And then we come to our kind of our contemporary moment where not just specifically about psychedelics, I mean about LSD, but about psychedelics in general is there's this, this offer that there is something objective going on here. There is something a little bit more than set and setting. And that is in, in this diagnostic criteria of openness or not quite, you know, a, a, or a psychological feature uh, of openness that it, whatever your overlay reactionary, liberatory, erotic, mystical, whatever your sort of your particular set and setting, there is this inherent tendency to create a kind of openness which we can see being associated with a set of um, political values 
of liberalism. And this idea is very pervasive within a lot of contemporary psychedelic work, which desperately wants to show that there are there is something inherently good and healing about this stuff, not just in the psychological sense, but as a larger cultural force. This is at the core of the ideology of maps, for example. You boil it down, Rick Doblin believes in by any means necessary, meaning that any mechanism that we use, however problematic, as long as it gets the drugs to more people, will produce a more utopian potential because of the way that these drugs in themselves produce these possibilities. Maybe yes, maybe no. I think our job as critics, as tricksters, as culture makers is to try to make sure that that's as true as possible, but also be wary of the ways that new ideologies sneak into what is it, to my mind, ever shifting protean stage of the way in which our concepts and protocols feed back into these situations and these experiences and the cultures that result. And so I'm very happy that this book exists because it's a roadmap for thinking that way in a way that people who aren't scholars can also understand. So thanks very much, Ido. Congratulations. Thank you, Eric. We're very glad that you exist. That was wonderful. It was wonderful to hear. We really appreciate it. Ido, the next video. As you saw, that video is called Not Mine by Guy Treffler. Now I'm delighted to introduce someone who is, of course, known to all of us who work in STS, Nancy Campbell. Nancy Campbell is professor and department head of science, technology, and society at Rensselaer in Troy, New York, a powerhouse in our field. Um, although she has a PhD, she writes that although she has a PhD in the history of consciousness, at the famous program at uh, UC Santa Cruz, 
She has been granted a green card as an historian of drugs, drug policy, drug treatment, and the sciences that lead to knowledge about drugs and their users. She has lately been interested in the histories and cultures of harm reduction. Her newest book is O.D. Nulaxone and the Politics of Overdose Prevention. After you've devoured that, you might, you will certainly want to read some of her other books, including Gendering Addiction, The Politics of Drug Treatment in a Neurochemical, Discovering Addiction, the Science and Politics of Substance Abuse Research, The, the Narcotic Farm, the Rise and Fall of America's First Prison for Drug Addicts, and Using Women, Gender, Drug Policy, and Social Justice. The title of her remarks is The Ineffable Intensification of Ontology. Nancy, we're delighted you're here. Thank you. I'm really delighted to be here. I'm going to go ahead and uh, could you enable me to share my screen? Yes, we're on it. Uh, are you, consider yourself enabled. All right, thank you very much. Uh, and of course, I'm delighted with um, Eric's um, presentation leading into this. Um, although I don't mention social construction, I think that uh, the ineffable intensification of ontology uh, leads from that uh, concern with mere social construction. What else could we do? Um, and so I, I'm riffing really on Edo's uh, a sentence of his about the psychedelic experience as one of intensified ontology. Um, no truer words were, have ever been spoken. I think that sentence could just as well, however, be used to characterize our field and the experience of science and technology studies since our really field altering turn from epistemology to ontology, from mere rocks to vibrant matter, uh, from simple knots to kaleidoscopic entanglements, from clear separation and distance to proximity and uh, closeness um, between the researcher and the researched and the really kind of intimate, um, the way in which set and setting become intimate uh, with both researcher and researched from epistemology then to ontology from knowing to being. Um, so in thinking about that, um, I thought a lot about where our field has been um, uh, without psychedelics, um, but being here now with psychedelics does require a bent for the very things that I think Ido, whom, whom by the way, I have never met um, and hope to someday. Uh, but being with psychedelics does require a kind of bent for hyper associative thinking, for openness to bouts of synesthesia, for dissolution of boundaries and categories that have been considered proper for making science and the intensely meaningful experiences and interactions that are core experiences uh, of psychedelics. So Ido asks after the pressures uh, that psychedelics have really exerted upon science and especially upon notions of objectivity and subjectivity, which I've been particularly interested in, uh, which all drugs do to some extent, but psychedelics of course do to a greater extent. Um, also simplicity, plain language, control, and even the very notion of standardization in science. So in some domains, these have been profoundly altered, whereas in other domains, they have yet to loose their rigid grip. And so that's been my fascination with psychedelics. Um, in our kind of psychonautic explorations of ineffability, uh, my co-author Laura Stark and I found that most inhabitants of that, and I'm a, you know, a, a sort of historian of the mid 20th century epistemic niche who were studying psychedelics, resorted to both methods of extraction and methods of ingression, confronting that sort of persistently psychedelic question, um, how can we really know 
uh, that which is beyond words. And that's a quote from our article in Social Studies of Science. So in, in many ways, that question became a generational one, but it's also one that really still dwells with us, uh, that we dwell within. The psychedelic sciences today still have that kind of question. And so for some experiences, right, they are beyond representation, beyond capture, but not beyond knowing in some way. And Ito's book is really a history of that present, of, of that kind of knowing. And American Trip is the chapter in which Ito explores the implications of the psychedelics for history, sociology, anthropology, and practice of the sciences. The demand that psychedelics exert upon the sciences is crystallized in a beautiful acrobatics that is intensely and uniquely beyond the limits of logical positivism and the practices that evolve to objectify drugs in ways that in a sense detached them from set and setting. And uh, this is actually a photograph, you can see maybe written on it, morphine and cocaine solutions. Uh, this is a, a photograph that to me, it was taken in a laboratory at the University of Michigan that I wrote about um, in Discovering Addiction. And um, it's a way in which pharmacology reduced drugs to actions, to effects, right? To pharmacology without epistemology. And you just keep that in your mind because my concluding slide will, uh, everything uh, meaning will fall um, into place. But this idea that pharmacology could move away from set and setting and not characterize it um, as part of um, what was exerting effects upon uh, subjects. This commitment to positivism, of course, brought about behavioral sciences that were stripped of epistemological and existential questions, leaving pharmacology free to standardize, to objectify, to randomize, to detach from, above all, uh, but, but above all, control, right, experimental subjects, and to shed philosophical questions of the epistemological and ontological kind. So if science, though, were not about that, if, they were, if it was not about detachment, what else could it be in our drug-suffused social worlds? Perhaps it could be more about sentience and experience, reattachment, reenchantment, diffraction, devising different solutions to the problems of knowing and being within uh, the ineffable. So the um, uh, obviously others have posed the, this problem. And one of those with whom I like to think um, along now, I realize with Ido, um, are Michael Polanyi, um, who once argued of the failure of the positivist moment in uh, the philosophy of science that too much lucidity destroys the subject matter of science. And his formulation of tacit knowing should have prepared us to be less unsettled by indeterminacy and by the sciences in many ways of the psychedelics, more intrigued by alternative or multiple objectivities, more alert to the structural kinship between subject and object that comes from what he called indwelling of one in the other. Now, in a lot of ways, our turn to ontology makes such implosions commonplace now in STS and also in psychedelic studies. And they are really central to the ontological thinking that is occurring within our uh, domain. I was so pleased to hear that all of you are kind of in this STS department. I had really honestly no idea what fellow travelers um, Ido's uh, reading his manuscript was going to open uh, uh, up to me. So I, I often have thought that Polanyi should take his place among psychedelic thinkers. For him, sentience was the most striking feature of our existence and the craft of making knowledge a full body experience I, I, I uh, distinctly think that the psychedelics um, play, uh, do, do not allow the separation into body and mind. Uh, the embodied enactment of mind is very important to that experience. Um, and so in thinking about knowledge, the capabilities and skills and sensibilities um, that cannot be fully expressed in words, um, in written or spoken word, really, although spoken word 
gets at it a little bit more deeply. But for scientists to rely on their own sense and sensibilities, their own flesh and mind and bones and brains to create and share and interpret knowledge. And so psychedelic thinking that is informed by set and setting and, and, and their real their entanglement, right, teaches us that it is not possible to think embodiment and sentience without indwelling. And the fascinating materiality of text of touch, of taste, loom large in this kind of work, um, of which so much is about dwelling within water or molecules of the air or patterns of dissolution and confluence, changes of scale and of shape. And for Ito, straightforward positivism was simply unsuited for understanding the content founding context effects and the integration of setting and setting set and setting rather than their denial or their avoidance or their their bracketing as we used to call it um, like uh, Donna Haraway's accounts of situated knowledges right um, there's no Edo finds no epistemic virtue in limiting the influence of sentience upon science rehabilitating a moral economy of science lies in Polanyi's insight that we know more than we can tell. And in approaching um, experiences of mental strangeness, it's hard to call them illness, but dream states, visions, um, much more, we recognize that others uh, cannot always express those experiences through words and even other forms of representation such as images or the tracings of EEGs that so often serve as scientific evidence in this domain historically. So among the scientific communities that we study and within our own field of STS, we have to think a lot about relations of interdependence with the existences that we seek to know. And that I take the ontological turn to be expressing, right, that we must really um, interact, right, with our subjects and objects of knowledge. They do not pre-exist our efforts to know them, but the act of knowing them brings them into being, produces them through the very process of knowing, which for many feminist scholars involves a responsive embodied process of ingression. And so doing knowing and being like this does not mean, of course, letting go of commitments. Um, well, no, it does mean um, letting go of commitments to falsifiability and detachment, um, and but finding something in their place, right? So if, if those are to be dislodged from the heart of the positivistic pharmacological enterprise, then what else um, uh, comes into that enterprise? Um, I am hopeful that we will finally be able to um, get to a point where I can interpret and finally discern um, the meaning of this t-shirt that I bought 30 years ago on the Haight-Ashbury, um, no epistemology without pharmacology, right? To, to reach a state, right? I've been waiting 30 years, Ido, to have an occasion to use that shirt, right? To show that sh shirt with its uh, somewhat mystical, um, uh, meaning. So in recognition that drug set and setting are now a kind of triple helix that preoccupies our body minds, American Trip um, was a very uh, beckoning, right, towards a, an intensified pluriverse where objectivity and subjectivity no longer exhaust the possibilities for being and doing and knowing. Um, so this, um, I leave you with this uh, somewhat uninterpreted uh, for an occasion, uh, you know, that to thank you uh, your, for your book and for uh, an occasion that was clearly designed uh, to recognize um, these kinds of uh, pluralities and multiplicities. I also want to thank Noah. Um, this is an extraordinary event and uh, I really appreciate uh, the multiple registers on which it's working. Thank you for um, inviting me. Thank you, Nancy. So wonderful. That was so wonderful. We really, really appreciate it. Ido, the next video.
עשרים ושתיים אותיות יסוד חקוקות בקול, חצובות ברוח, קבועות בפה בחמישה מקומות בגרון, בחך בלשון, בשיניים, בשפתיים, עשרים ושתיים אותיות שקשר בלשונו, וגילה את סודו. משכן בעין דלקן באש, עשן ברוח בערן בשבעה להגן בשנים עשר מזלות, עשרים ושתיים אותיות, חקקן חצן שקלן המירן צרפן כל יצור וכל העתיד לצור יסוד שלוש אמות, שבע כפולות, מנדוממת שין שורקת אלף חוק מכריע בינתיים, שלוש אמות שהם שלושה אבות, מהם יצא אש רוח מים, שבע כפולות, שבע כפולות, בית ות, גימל גימל, דלת דלת, כף כף, פי פי, רש רש, תף תף, שבע כפולות, שבע ולא שש, שבע כפולות, שבע ולא שמונה That was 22 letters by Victoria Khanna. The first time I saw that video was, it was being projected onto Victoria Khanna as she danced in a small club in Tel Aviv at one o'clock in the morning. I thought that I was seeing God. Our next speaker is, and we're delighted to have you, is David Dupois. David Dupois. holds a PhD in social anthropology and is a research fellow in the Department of Anthropology of Durham University and a member of the Hearing the Voice interdisciplinary research program there. Based on a decade of ethnographic surveys conducted in the Peruvian Amazon and in Europe, his research focuses on the globalization of the use of psychedelic substances. His research explores more broadly the relationships between hallucinations and culture in a comparative anthropological perspective. The title of his remarks is The Socialization of Hallucinations, Anthropological Insights on Set and Setting. David, we're delighted that you're here. Thanks, Noah, and uh, thanks a lot, Aido, for your kind invitation to this very exciting event. It's a real pleasure to be here. For this short talk, I will pick up on a remark you made in your book, Ido, the fact that alongside psychiatric and psychological perspectives, there have existed a less known anthropological approach on set and setting. 
One early example is the American ethnographer James Mooney, who is exhaustively presented in your book. But more broadly, anthropologists working on the cultural context of psychedelic drug use in Native American societies have long observed homogeneity in the features of the psychedelic experience within the same cultures, and have been led to defend a culturalist approach to psychedelic experience. While Timothy Leary coined the term set and setting for these extrapharmacological factors shaping the drug experience, the prominent French anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss proposed, for instance, to consider hallucinogens as triggers and amplifiers of Latin discourse that each culture holds in reserve and for which drugs can allow or facilitate the elaboration. The renewed interest uh, from the global north in psychedelics, which has given rise to shamanic tourism and the renaissance of clinical research on psychedelics, has invited recently numerous young anthropologists to focus on these topics. I would like in this short presentation to give a glimpse of the anthropological approach to the extrapharmacological factors of the psychedelic experience. Dialoguing with some insight of your very inspiring book, Ido, I will briefly present my work on the use of the psychedelic, psychedelic brew ayahuasca in the context of shamanic tourism in the Peruvian Amazon to illustrate the type of contrib contribution that social anthropology can make to a better understanding of set and setting. So as a social anthropologist, I started to conduct anthropological survey about 10 years ago in the upper Peruvian Amazon. As you know, participation in exotic rituals using psychedelic substances have been indeed increasingly popular with the, with the Western public since the second half of the 20th century. Fueled by the craze for the psychedelic brew ayahuasca, an influx of travelers has headed towards the Peruvian Amazon since few decades. Mm -hmm. Consequently, many reception centers for this clientele have appeared around the metropolitan areas of the Amazon. These so-called shamanic centers are frequently based on the partnership between Westerners and Metis or indigenous locals and offer to an international clientele the opportunity to participate in ritual activities inspired more or less freely by the practices of the Peruvian mestizo shamanism, such as the ritual use of ayahuasca, purgative plants and diets, which are in this context frequently surrounded by lectures, integration sessions, and speech group. Founded in 1992 by the French doctor in medicine, Jack Mabit, as well as Peruvian and Spanish collaborators, the therapeutic community of Takiwasi is both an addiction treatment clinic and one of the main places in the region hosting Western travelers to meet ayahuasca. The premises are located in the city of Tarapoto in the upper Peruvian Amazon. Between 2008 and 2013, I conducted an extensive doctoral ethnographic investigation in this institution. In the meanwhile, I also worked with native healers and other shamanic centers of the area in order to compare the social practices and symbolic frameworks surrounding the use of ayahuasca. During my investigation, I have been struck by the differences in the participants' experience during the ayahuasca ritual offered by these different institutions. For instance, in Takiwasi, sequences of demonic possession were frequently occurring during ayahuasca rituals, while this phenomenon was absent in the other places where I conducted the survey. So ethnographic comparisons suggested in this respect that cultural and symbolic elements such as cosmological and etiological theories, as well as the features of the ritual devices specific to each institution, were strongly influencing the formal characteristic of the psychedelic experience. Over time, Takiwasi has indeed gradually based its, its etiological theory on infestation, a concept derived from Catholic demonology, referring to a minor form of demonic possession, which is taught in Takiwasi as the cause of pathologies such as addiction. The frequency of possession phenomena that frequently occur during rituals seem to be, in this sense, correlated to the importance given to this cultural pattern in the institution. This was not a great discovery in itself since many anthropologists have observed homogeneity in the features of the psychedelic experience within the same culture, which has led them to defend a culturalist approach to psychedelic hallucinations. If some candidates have been proposed by anthropologists to shed light on the factors of the enculturation of the hallucinogenic experience, such as myth mythological and cosmological knowledge, kinship system or iconographic representations, the vectors by which the features of hallucinations are structured by social factors have been so far little explored and require further study. I have therefore focused my work on trying to understand the dynamics through which cultural background and social interactions shape not only the relationship to the psychedelic experience, but also its very phenomenological content. 
a dynamic which I have proposed to call socialization of hallucinations. Based on my fieldwork observation, I distinguish two levels of socialization of hallucinations, arguing that not only do cultural background and social interactions organize one's relationship to the hallucinogenic experience, but also shape its very phenomenological content. So how do social settings organize the relationship to the hallucinogenic experience? To answer this question, I feel that we must focus our attention on the interactional context that surround the psychedelic experience in Takiwasi and elsewhere. First of all, the ritual, and on the other end, the speed group that in the context of shamanic uh, centers are frequently following the ritual experience and during which participants learn to narrate their psychedelic experience in the jeu de langage of the social group. My hypothesis is that these interactions might impact metacognitive processes as the inferential processes managing the categorization of perceptions and mental states, which are therefore prone to be interpreted as things of the presence, agency, and identity of culturally postulated supernatural entities. While the ingestion of the psychedelic brew give rise to intense and confusing perceptual and perceptions and emotional arousal, and that ritual context on rules like darkness, prohibition to move around or interact with other participants, lead participants to focus their attention on their inner experience. The ritual and verbal interactions invites participants to narrate and organize their experience through the prism of the categories proposed by the social group. Now, what about social interactions shaping the phenomenological content of psychedelic experience? The fact is that many participants reported during my investigation the fact that during ayahuasca rituals, some interactions with ritual specialists, the so-called shamans, radically and almost immediately transformed the content of their psychedelic experience. In particular, people emphasized the impact on the very content of their visual and auditory imagery, uh, the acts, action as like the ritual songs or the blowing of perfumes on the, or tobacco smoke. This testimony raised question about how sensory stimuli such as sounds and perfumes influence visual and auditory imagery. I would suggest that this is partly based on their emotional property and the hedonic tone pleasant or unpleasant of sounds and of smells. My claim is that it is through these emotional properties that perceptual stimuli influence the content of visual and auditory verbal imagery during the psychedelic experience. In the context of the ayahuasca ritual, the emotional properties of perfumes and music meet the synesthetic properties of the psychotropic brew, which promotes cross-modal perceptions. The brew, which generally increases emotional and perceptual sensitivity, also stimulates the production of a rich visual and auditory imagery, the content of which is then shaped by the emotional state of the participants. Apart from this sudden transformation in visual and auditory imagery, the observation over the course of the participant's experience underlines also a progressive homogenization of the formal characteristic of the psychedelic experience during ayahuasca rituals, which are progressively organized according to few recurring patterns. This trend was illustrated in particular by the stereotypical nature of the visions of supernatural entities. Uh, the perception of demons, entities of the Catholic pantheon, or pedagogical snake was thus reported by many participants during interviews. On one hand, these testimonies are striking first for their congruence with Catholic iconography, which the participants, most often from this religious culture, consistently highlighted during interviews. On the other hand, the spirit of ayahuasca is often seen as a snake or a woman with vegetal and snaky features. This scene is one of the major tropes of iconography spe specific to the shamanic tourism subculture. So these elements, uh, this points to the influence of the shared culture of the participants whose visionary scene seems to constitute the projective support. These observ observations invite us to approach the recurring patterns of hallucinatory images as an example of invasion of perception by culture. Perception in this sense cannot be understood as a passive reception of information by the sensory organs. In this perspective, Psychedelic perception can be cast as a particular case of Bayesian inference, a predictive bet emerging from the encounter between expectations and sensory stimuli, which are then reduced to forms identified by our past knowledge and past experiences. The ritual on, the, on discursive device surrounding the use of ayahuasca therefore appears not only to be able to organize the relationship with the psychedelic experience, but also to gradually 
homogenized its very content. The duration of exposure to these practices seems to be a driving force in this regard. The degree of stereotypization of hallucinatory patterns is indeed higher among experienced users than among newcomers. This suggests that the mechanism that ensures the association of ambiguous visual and auditory imagery with identifiable elements are highly plastic and likely to be gradually modified and patterned by the social environment. So because of their ability to be deeply influenced by symbolic backgrounds and social interactions, psychedelic experiences appear thus as very singular perceptions. The cognitive penetrability thesis of perceptions, which asserts that the content of perceptual experience can be influenced by prior or concomitant factors such as belief, fear, or desires, is a controversial empirical hypothesis when it concerns regular perceptions. Following ethnographic data, however, it seems that this thesis can be considerably more asserted with respect to hallucinations. We may then better understand the place, the place occupied by hallucinogens in the social life of numerous indigenous groups of the Americas. The projective composition of hallucinogenic experiences make them indeed the support of an experiential, of experiential verification of cultural propositions. Regardless of culture, perceptual experience is indeed for human beings a fundamental source of epistemic justification, a justification for believing that a proposition is true. Insofar as we have seen, psychedelics are able to produce perception whose phenomenological content is strongly influenced by culture. The noetic properties of psychedelics may enhance the significance and attribution of reality to cultural worldviews as metaphysical, ontological, or supernatural claims. I claim that these properties make psychedelic substances powerful potential vectors of cultural transmission by producing a, communi a community of experience Ritual use of psychedelics is thus a vector of cultural transmission, affiliation to the social group, and are particularly efficient for the transmission of metaphysical proposition relating to the supernatural realm. To conclude, this observation highlights the state of high suggestibility in which psychedelic substances place users, a property of psychedelics that either you are strongly underlying in your book. If this is probably one of the underpinnings of the therapeutic efficacy of psychedelics. It also raised serious ethical question in the current context of globalization of the use of the substances. Numerous psychedelic substances such as ayahuasca have been indeed recently banned in various countries in the global north. In France, the government has, for instance, expressed serious concern about the possible use of ayahuasca by so-called cult groups for the purpose of psychological manipulations or brainwashing. This point raises the ethical implication of one of the striking features of psychedelic induced experience, their ability to increase truth to cultural propositions and reverence to the holders of these propositions. So as we proposed in a forthcoming paper written with Chris Timmerman and Rosalind Watts from Imperial College, these features of the psychedelic experiences may act as a double-edged sword. While this mechanism may drive therapeutic benefits, the ability of psychedelics to induce feeling of reverence and revelation might lead to problematic effects in certain contexts. These issues and concern may consequently require further study as a renewed interest for these substances is generally observed in global north through the rise of shamanic tourism and the renaissance of psychedelic science. Well, I will have to stop here, but for those interested, I have recently published an article that aims to model the dynamic of socialization of hallucinations. I can put the link on the chat and I am otherwise preparing a special issue of cultural transcultural psychiatry journal focusing on the cultural and ethical challenges of the renewed interest for psychedelics in global north which will hopefully be published next year. So thanks to all for your attention and thanks again Ido for your invitation and again congrats for your very very fascinating book. Thank you. Thank you David and congratulations and yes please do put that that link in the chat. I'd be very eager oh. to read that. Okay. Um, Ido, the, uh, the next and last video.
A higher consciousness is linked intrinsic. We fly mystic. Now, homie, that ain't science fiction. That's scientific. We more gang, who science is this? We trying to visit my soul existing five dimensions. The sky's the limit. I did my bit on other planets. Landed on Kimmy. Forgot myself and now I'm stranded. Abandoned mission. My dreams portray fantastic visions. Extract the liquid. The waters that Atlantis slipped in. I'm still swimming in that language. It's multiversal. Pages and journals. My journey here is ending soon. We blow me eternal. My mind expands and widens strands of indigo and purple. This music not commercial. Just the square to meet that circle. It's internal and encoded in my system. My heart it always knows the beat, but I don't never listen. The stars they sing a song that holds a message in the lyrics. I strain my ears to hear it, but it's too much interference. It's too much interference. I put one in the air to clear it. I'm trapped up in this surface world and caught up in appearance. These legs peeling, I feel it. That sense of nearness in states of high awareness. You can feel this with your spirit. How does it feel? 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 How do you feel? How does it feel? How does it feel? How does it feel? How do you feel? How does it feel? How does it feel? How does it feel? How do you feel? How does it 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 feel? Stands. The DJ play that music and we fall into that trance. We gather in the ciphers and recite our tribal chants. Then resurrect the spirits to help us finish the dance. Finish the we dance. resurrect the spirits to help us finish the dance. Finish the we dance. resurrect the spirits to help us finish the dance. dance. We resurrect the spirits to help us finish the dance. dance. We resurrect the spirits to help us finish the dance. dance. We resurrect the spirits to help us finish the dance. We resurrect the spirits to help us finish the dance. That video was called Kingdom Crumbs, again, by Ori Tor. I should say that all the videos that you saw tonight are from the Israeli collection of the Psychedelic Video Museum. Alongside them, you can find 3,000 other videos at the site, some from Israel and many from all around the world. That uh, URL, again, is psychedelicvideomuseum.org.org. And now it's time for our last um, speaker before we get to hear from the man for whom we've all gathered tonight, Ido. And our last speaker, and we are truly delighted um, that he found a way in a difficult moment to make the time to be here, is Professor Nicholas Langlitz. Professor, Professor Nicholas Langlitz is an anthropologist and historian of science who holds advanced degrees in medicine, history of medicine, and medical anthropology. He is the author of Neuropsychedelia, the revival of hallucinogen research since the decade of the brain. And he is the author very recently of Chimpanzee Culture Wars, Rethinking Human Nature Alongside Japanese, European, and American Cultural Primatologists, just out from Princeton University Press, about which I just read it last week, and oh my God, read the book, it's brilliant. Uh, Nicholas Langlitz is the chair of the Department of Anthropology at the New School, and the title of his remarks is Political Psychopharmacology. Thank you so much, Noah and Ido. Um, hang on, I have some notes which I'm looking for. So um, uh, I, I'm I'm really delighted to to be with you today. Um, I, you know, American Trip is is a wonderful and uh, for me very useful book about the role of set and setting in the psychedelic experience. And um, as you all know by now, what 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 one thing that makes it so interesting is that. It's not just about uh, an uh, individual user's set and the immediate environment, whether it's laboratory, clinic, rave, or whatever, um, as, as the setting, but about the setting of 20th century America at large and about the mindset of 20th century Americans. Um, I want to say a few things um, in what Bruno Latour um, called 
the positive modality, um, uh, I think it's one of the uh, very useful concepts from Latour's uh, Science in Action. He distinguished this between uh, positive and negative modality um, in terms of how, how you take up um, published research. So the negative modality is very much what uh, we are used to doing in STS. You open the black box, you attend to the conditions of how a scientific fact or a knowledge claim is being constructed, and thereby you reveal the contingency. It could have been constructed otherwise. And that makes the negative modality potentially critical. Um, I assume that, um, the peer reviewers of MIT Press have um, engaged with uh, American TRIP sufficiently in the negative modality. Um, so I will um, talk a little bit about it in the positive modality, which is basically what every scientist wishes for, um, that others will build on their knowledge claims as established facts and take them for granted and move on from there. Um, so I don't think that the positive modality is necessarily desirable in the humanities or social sciences. Um, I, I sometimes would wish that people would engage with my work more in a negative modality. But um, since I've recently been thinking about doing some work that could build on Edo's work, I, I want to uh, pursue this line of thought today. Um, one thing that struck me when I, um, read American Trip were some parallels between the 1960s and the present, this extreme political polarization uh, of American life. Back then it was the Vietnam War, it was um, uh, racism, the civil rights movement, free speech, the economic order. And today, apart from the Vietnam War, uh, we're still or again facing many of the same issues here in, in the US. I live in New Jersey. Um, some of them have slightly different uh, politics around them, like you know, free speech is, is probably more uh, uh, claimed by Breitbart News than by on the Berkeley campus today. But, um, but, but a lot of these, these issues have, have just persisted. And in this context, uh, psychedelics um, were presented as agents um, of both political radicalization and uh, of uh, depoliticization. Just think of how Timothy Leary mocked student activists as young men with menopausal minds. Um, so dropping out was also dropping out of the political conflict that was raging at the time. Um, I was thinking about the contemporary uh, context of this uh, first when uh, Ido invited me to uh, join a, a panel that he organized when he was a postdoc at Harvard with Rick Doblin. Um, and um, at the time, uh, Rick Doblin had just, or MAPS had just received a major donation from Rebecca Mercer, who was also one of the uh, main donors uh, of Trump's first presidential campaign and uh, the owner of Breitbart News. Um, and it, it led me to think more about the role of psychedelics on the right. So on the one hand, of course, there is this persistent post countercultural liberalism that Rick Doblin embodies which you know, goes along with, with environmentalism, with um, a renewed a discourse on anti-racism, feminism, and so on. But on the other hand, there is also a psychedelic scene which you don't get to see at these psychedelic conferences, um, but which gathers around a journal such as Tear, named after a, a Nordic war god, which uh, promotes a form of white identity politics and which publishes uh, articles by the Italian fascist um, uh, Evola uh, right next to an interview with Ralph Metzner. Um, or think of um, leaders of Brazilian ayahuasca churches uh, who have backed and financially supported uh, Bolsonaro in a big way. So this rightist uh, politics of um, of psychedelics has, has also uh, had a comeback. And um, it, this, this, this poses a 
problem that American trip addresses in a wonderful way, I think, and I've written a, a very little bit about it uh, this summer in a short piece titled Rightist Psychedelia. Um, the question that uh, this raises is um, whether we should understand the effects of psychedelics as a blank screen for contradictory interpretations, a little bit like a Rorschach test, or whether one substance can produce opposite effects. And I think what um, makes psychedelics so fascinating from an STS perspective is that they're not just inactive placebos, but highly potent psychotropic drugs, and yet they can generate very different effects that depend on set and setting. Um, the question posed but not really answered by both American Trip and my own book Neuropsychedelia is how to take this insight forward, how to redesign psychopharmacological research in a way that acknowledges this insight. And of course, there are some approaches that already exist. Ido writes about um, Anthony Wallace's culture control trials or um, Bruce Alexander's Red Park experiment, for example. Um, I, I would say both of these approaches are um, still in what Ido criticizes as a positivist approach. Uh, I have thought a little bit about whether actor network theory um, uh, might uh, provide some way forward. So you understand the agency of psychedelic drugs, not just by assigning it to the drug itself, but by distributing it across a whole network of drugs, brains, pharmacogenetics, environmental factors, social interactions, and so on. Um, and Ido has uh, uh, explored a different route, which is the extended case method, um, studying uh, drug effects in the manner of reflexive sociology. Um, studying field effects of sociocultural contexts instead of trying to neutralize them. And of course, again, extending this conception of field uh, to uh, the cultural and political sphere at large. Um, one thing I've been thinking about since I uh, completed um, work on uh, chimpanzee culture was for which I did um, field work with uh, field primatologists who study chimpanzee cultures uh, in um, in the rainforest, but also uh, I also worked with laboratory researchers who studied uh, the cognitive foundations of culture in the lab, was that psychopharmacology uh, is, is almost exclusively a laboratory science and uh, it, it opens up to the clinic obviously, but it, it could be taken to the field. And I, I think that there is a little bit of research uh, on ayahuasca, for example, um, that could be described as a form of field psychopharmacology, but I think th this might be an, an, an area where uh, STS and um, psychopharmacology might be able to um, uh, invent uh, some, some new forms of research together that might also be more tolerable for uh, positivistically minded uh, pharmacologists. So, um, what, what I would really uh, like to see, and I submitted a grant earlier this year with two psychiatrists and a, a medical historian uh, hoping to, to be able to take some of this forward, would be to, to develop more approaches like this in conversation with psychopharmacologists. Um, and in particular, I would be interested in uh, studying the moral and political effects of psychedelics and of course also of other drugs. I think about this in analogy to uh, the way uh, there, there is a moral psychology that has emerged since the 1990s and there is a political psychology and, and both of these fields are doing very interesting work, especially at, at present in the context of the, the extreme uh, political polarization, understanding the cognitive and behavioral foundations of uh, what we're seeing on the news every day. Um, and I, I think one, one could learn from that and think about how to develop a moral and political psychopharmacology. Um, and I think American Trip could be read as a first step in that direction. And it definitely provides a very, very rich foundation for that. Um, so to conclude, I just want to um, uh, share one with, wish with, with Ido, which is that there will be a sequel to American Trip um, on uh, set and setting and the psychedelic experience in the 21st century. 
Thank you. Thank you very much for that very positive modality. Um, we really appreciate it. I really appreciate your being here. And now, Ido, you spend, um, you know, years writing a book and you end up getting 20 minutes on Zoom as uh, as payment for it. We'd love to, to hear you now. Right. Wow. Uh, what a trip. Uh, thank you. Um, so first, I want to just take this moment to thank everybody who helped to bring this evening together. Uh, I want to thank all the people who turned up tonight to be part of this collective conversation about psychedelics, about their cultural dimensions. It's a conversation that's growing and uh, we're hearing ever more voices and I think it's just turning more and more interesting. Uh, I want to thank all of the speakers uh, for really generously agreeing to take part in this evening. I, I don't take this for granted at all. I'm really honored to have such brilliant minds here with me celebrating this book, uh, which is the culmination of so many years work and have has also been inspired by, in many ways, by your many of your own works. So uh, really honored and thankful uh, for having you here and for these very generous, generous words and for bringing up uh, these very rich, diverse perspectives on, on American trip uh, that I would never have thought about myself. So it just goes to show me how deep the rabbit hole goes and how much more we have to go. And that makes me happy. Uh, I, I want to also thank the graduate program in science, technology and society in bar -Ilan University and the many great people it hosts, uh, many of which are here tonight with us. And I want to thank them for giving me a home for my research over the past decade. Uh, American Trip evolved and developed within this very rich theoretical environment and very warm human environment. And I had the privilege of being part uh, of this program and uh, benefiting from this intellectually uh, and, and, and in the writing of this book. And that's something that I'm deeply grateful for. And finally, I, I wanna thank uh, Noah uh, uh, personally for bringing all of this together and for hosting this event. And, and uh, as Noah mentioned, he was the supervisor of my PhD thesis. Uh, that was the basis uh, of American Trip. And I got so much support from him over the ways uh, from the moment that I started and didn't, wasn't even sure if you could write about a dissertation about psychedelic, if it's even legal, you know, that was like uh, 10 years back and uh, it didn't seem quite uh, as trivial then as it does now in a sense. So that thing later came, uh, became a real book, actually uh, uh, much through the encouragement of Noah and Oren uh, from the program. So uh, thank you, Noah, and thank you both. Uh, and um, I want to use the, the time we have to uh, left for a short discussion with uh, our panelists. Uh, and I have uh, one or two questions that I have on my mind these days concerning these crucial questions uh, of, of psychedelics and culture. So uh, I, have, uh, I have basically one central question, which might be uh, enough to uh, uh, just to uh, tease out for the next uh, for the for the time that we have, but uh, I'll, I'll just ask it. So, uh, uh, so my question is: um, There's this transformation going on in psychedelic culture that people who've been with the psychedelic culture, and a lot of the people who are here tonight, ha have been observing this culture for a longer time. And they're observing this transformation and it's making a lot of uh, impressions. So uh, for many years, psychedelic culture was identified with this sort of counterculture of movement that challenged the values and the norms of mainstream society. But then over the past couple of years, uh, it's seen something changed. There was this talk of mainstreaming of psychedelics and uh, it seems suddenly uh, uh, to be welcomed into a mainstream society and achieving this growing cultural prominence, which to many people and myself included was really surprising to see this. And I'm still uh, 
uh, I don't know, um, uh, brushing my eyes just to, to, to believe in this moment, in 2020, that uh, uh, everything that I'm seeing is, is really true and that psychedelic, uh, psychedelics have achieved this cultural prominence. So, uh, but then this, this raises some really tough questions for, for this culture and its um, ongoing development that's, that was limited to this smaller, um, more uh, delimited enclave in the past. And uh, we're seeing psychedelic culture morphing into something else. And, and the question is, uh, so is this, if it's happening, what is it morphing to? What is becoming of psychedelic culture? I mean, I've, I've, I've portrayed uh, the psychedelic culture of the 60s and, and how it uh, evolved also, uh, in a sense, how it, uh, how it influenced this psychedelic culture that we know today, but many of these things are are seem to, are seem to be uh, getting complicated and getting more um, uh, problematized over the past couple of years. And Nicholas mentioned the the, the right wing aspect on psychedelia, and Eric I think mentioned also the mainstreaming. And and so so what is be, what is to become of psychedelic culture? And then the question is. Is, is there a fundamentally weird, fundamentally countercultural element to this culture, or is it just becoming part of a mainstream culture? It, it, can this become our mainstream culture in, in this uh, globalized world and, uh, or, 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 uh, or a central part of it? And, uh, or maybe we're going to see uh, the splitting of psychedelic culture into many psychedelic cultures. And if that's what we're going to see, then what kind of relationships do you envision uh, developing between these different psychedelic cultures post of, of, of post uh, of, of post everything that you knew about in the past? Uh, that's my question. I hope somebody has an answer. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? We hear you perhaps too much. <laughs> Sorry about that. I have some problems. Uh, I can't have my video and my sound on at the same time, but you'll have to excuse me. I'm not sure if you can hear me now. <laughs> yes, we okay, hear you. Okay, great. Um, I just want to say that if Netflix has any indication, then I think uh, then I think we're going downhill. Um, some part of the mainstreaming of psychedelics in the past few years has gone through like kind of a, uh, a, a like a new age wellness um, co-opting kind of aesthetic that it's kind of meshed into that you can see um, you can see it address addressing people who maybe haven't experienced the psychedelic experience um, through the media uh, first and it might be actually a counter to to what happened during the war on drugs where the first encounter that people had with psychedelics before they tried them were was a um, negative you know portrayal of uh, psychedelics in the media and now it's like an over positive one so i'm wondering i think a lot about media because that's where i come from but uh i'm thinking a lot about how it's portrayed in the media and i can see that it's it's gone through a lot of change in that sense so, I mean, people might be approaching it over positively before the actual experience, uh, and that might bring different, a different experience than, um, than approaching it over negatively with, you know, anxiety because of the portrayal in the media. Um, so it would be interesting to see how, you know, the, the extra positive approach that people might have to psychedelics before they try them, maybe, you know, might bring a little bit of disappointment. Um, maybe with the the media is promising all these, you know, experiences that that the people creating the media have had, and then the people going and experiencing it themselves 
after watching those materials uh, would have certain expectations that the experience wouldn't meet. So that might be something that would happen uh, in these times. You know, I can pick up on that and say, well, I think that's really a great question to ask, but the opposite is also true. If, if, it, if it, it could well be the case that we're in sort of a, I, I think of it as a transition point where for a little while anyway, those that the priming, the positive priming that's coming from authorities, from journalists and from clinicians and wellness coaches and all that, that is entering into the mainstream may actually allow a sort of space of efficacy um, and that uh, people will get what they want more or less for a time. Uh, and I think it's kind of, a, I, I mean, the way I'm, I'm sort of thinking about it is that you, you sort of get a pass for a little while where you're actually able to, as David is describing these kinds of ways that social cues, priming, this sort of uh, cultural homogenization has a sort of space, a little iterative room to establish itself. But as the field itself I, uh, continues to multiply and diversify in the way that, that Ito pointed out, then in a way, maybe you get like, you get a ride for a bit and then it gets complicated again. And it gets complicated because there are these multiple groups and multiple narratives. So it's not a homogenous environment. So at the same time that I can look at, I'm just gonna stay on Netflix. I can look at Netflix and look at a wellness new age kind of approach. I can look at a scientific, more or less scientific sort of, you know, pop science document, documentarian approach. Uh, but then I can go to like Midnight Gospel and I see something that's actually really kind of weird still. Uh, and it's, you know, it's sort of mutant or, or the videos that, that, that Ido and others have, have collated there. So I've already have like, even within a pretty narrow media channel, a, a, a range there. And I, you know, and I think the bigger question then to go, okay, so maybe we're in just a period of transition where almost the material, you can almost look at it from the materials point of view, they're able to use this mainstreaming to just move and spread and broaden their, their, and their, their, their surfaces of encounter. And the initial reception is somewhat naive. And it's very positive because everyone's freaked out about the mental health crisis. Everybody knows we haven't come up with good uh, drugs since Prozac, which isn't a very good drug anyway. And that a lot of what we're seeing is just sort of half-ass constructions of healing in a way that isn't really working with contemporary stresses. So everybody, a lot of people really want this to work idealistically. And so we, maybe we get a pass, but on the far side of it is this question. What does it look like when the culture that is producing the priming is profoundly unhomogenous and it is mutating in multiple ways? And speaking from an American perspective, this is really clear because you see the clinical research, you see the sort of mainstream liberalism of a kind of MAPS point of view, but then we're right alongside of that, we also have all these decriminalization movements and the cultures associated with decriminalization are very different. Some of them are quite radical, uh, uh, you know, anti-capitalist. Others are very invested in certain divisions between pharmacology as evil, you know, as far, you know, in terms of pharmaceutical companies and natural medicines as sort of good. So you're already having those splits are like active. So if you're like, if you're in the Bay Area and you're into psychedelic culture, it's already a very diverse and conflictual in many ways environment as well as a kind of open-ended one. How will this actually you know, affect people's experiences. And so I kind of feel mainstreaming is sort of like a phase on the far end of which you will have new age wellness clinics that people, they don't meet the shadow. It's all kind of blissy or whatever for a while, maybe. But then there's all these other things and the conflicts between them will create more dynamics. And then the final thing I want to say is just that from the kinds of questions people have been raising today in terms of SDS, in terms of constructionism, in terms of you know, these, these feedback loops, we get to understand the question that's been kind of the, the elephant in the room here, which is that if psychedelics aren't, a, if, even if LSD, psychedelics aren't a Rorschach blot, they have their own affordances, they have their own 
preferences. They have their own characterological zing. What is it? How can we name it without just not reproducing another loop, telling another narrative that flips into some other sociological condition? Is it even possible? Well, now we get to see, because if we are paying attention to these various stories and paying attention to the phenomenology, I mean, David's approach is, is, is absolutely great. And this idea of fields, psychopharmacology and all that is just seems really important because I think we are going to see a number of very diverse expressions on the far side of the mainstreaming. We just have to look for them because they're not always going to be as obvious as the mainline wellness uh, approach. Maybe that's a good moment for me to... Oh, sorry. Can, can I jump in? Sorry, we'd, or, or is anyone organizing? Yes, jump in. Okay, so I mean that, that, that's a good moment for me to, to jump in because I, I totally agree with Eric um, and my answer to uh, Ido's question would also be that uh, we're moving from, I mean, I, I, I guess there was never one psychedelic culture. I mean, even if you go back to the 60s, you had the hats and the freaks and, and all these things. Um, but uh, I, I think there is definitely pluralization uh, going on and the pluralization of is inevitably accompanied by conflict. And I think we are also already seeing that um, even within you know, this, this more narrowly confined psychedelic community that meets at the conferences, I, I constantly hear some, some background noise about uh, people uh, you know, building different camps and, and, and fighting over things and so on. Um, I, I, I I mean, for me, you know, I, I, my sense is also that um, my, my, my curiosity is definitely more developed than my political passions. So in, in some sense, I look at this with delight. I, I find it fascinating. And I think that the uh, potential that, you know, in, in some sense, we, 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 we still don't really know what a psychedelic is. And, and of course, there's lots of different psychedelics and they're all different. Um, and and, and they, they will become even more different as they start interacting with these different sets and settings. And, and that's, that's only becoming apparent now. Um, even though I um, very, very much agree with Eric about the, um, uh, uh, you know, moving constructionism beyond social constructionism, especially in the context of psychedelics. I also think that there is a um, purely interpretive dimension to, to this. There are things where, um, you know, you, you, can, you can pick certain aspects of psychedelic experiences and uh, con consider, you know, those aspects uh, key rather than other aspects. And I think uh, we're also seeing more of that, like, you know, do you primarily value unitive experiences uh, and, and, and maybe even, you know, a, a ego dissolution that is so radical and complete that you have moved way beyond thinking uh, about other people uh, in terms of empathy and love and, and so on, right? So, I mean, with, with, which, which aspects of these experiences do you value most? And, and, and which ones do you highlight and, and, and with, from which do you draw inspiration? Um, I think th that is something that is happening. Um, I mean, of, of course, they, 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 they have to be afforded by the substances, the, these experiences, but people pick and choose. And th there is that dimension as well. And that ultimately leads to, to competing philosophical interpretations. and. Uh, what, what I'm really looking forward to is seeing a broader diversity of philosophical interpretations of, of the psychedelic experience. And, and I think we are already seeing that. So, you know, in, in th this year I've read more about uh, psychedelic humanisms, and I think they're very much at odds with, uh, with, with the more mystical traditions that Huxley and yeah. others stood for, which were really anti-humanist. Um, so you know th this is something that that I think is 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 very exciting about uh, where 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 we are moving now. Can I jump in, uh, Ido? Absolutely. Now oh. you go, but you can jump yeah. in. Yeah, 
I feel that what your book and the, the more broadly the work of social scientists uh, shows uh, is that you can't think about psychedelics from a pharmacological automatism perspective. I remember like at the last, at the last breaking convention in London, like one of the founders of uh, Extinction Rebellion Movement, you know, like uh, the uh, call for psychedelic uh, civil disobedience because the, the substances were supposed to produce biophilia, you know, and thus save us from the ec ecological crisis by making us animists. So in my view, even if it could sound like a good idea, it's also very naive, like psychedelics are essentially tools for transmission and intensification of cultural claims. And I mean, think about Charles Manson and the, on his group, like the LSD didn't stop them from driving nuts and developing racist uh, theories and uh, eventually carrying out uh, murders. So another example is that where LSD was used as a countercultural tool in the 60s in California, it's now being used in microdose by senior executive in Silicon Valley to increase their performance, their adaptation to the demands of the market and capitalism. So as you show in your book, you know, like even if psychedelics have, of course, their own affordances and stimulates creativity, they are also like non-specific cultural amplifiers. So in this perspective, like I feel that the mainstream, uh, the, the psychedelic doing mainstream will probably produce, as you suggest, you know, like a multitude of cultures. And that can be also very, very good news because like the risk, of, the risk with the medicalization of psychedelics is that the fact of the substances will be captured by medical representations, which would be a terrible impoverishment in my opinion. So I don't think that we will, should seek to capture the power of psychedelics in one direction, even if this direction seems good to us. There is a pluralization, there will be conflict, alliances and creativity, but it's okay, you know, it's just social life and uh, the psychedelics could be a part of this. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah. Yeah, can I jump in here? I think we'll we'll start um, because I also believe that that um, psychedelics have to be uh, demedicalized, kept from being contained within that apparatus which values specificity of action, etc. Um, I think we will have to, though, you know, maybe um, unsettle set. Uh, one of the aspects of psychedelics that has, I think is very valuable, um, and I think just exactly what uh, Nicola was just uh, talking about, the expectations with which you approach them and what you value about them, is that they are unsettling, that ontological insecurity and ontological security are always opened up by psychedelics in ways that um, might be uh, somewhat uh, dangerous for some individuals, whereas uh, they could be somewhat um, uh, not exactly comforting uh, for, for others. And so I think that they, that the heterogeneity and, of individual response and variation, right? It's not just set and setting, right? There's also pharmacological um, activity there that we cannot simply ascribe to society, to culture. I mean, that's what makes them interesting. That, that, and sometimes I do think that um, people who think about ontology sound like animists, um, that there is a kind of animation and a agentic um, activity that we have to we have to think about, we have to take into account. So I meant that um, in, in my remarks when I was talking about the pluriverse, that, um, that that's very important. I just don't think they will ever truly mainstream uh, because I think that there are many people who are not open to that level of plurality or that level of ontological insecurity um, that, that it's not that, that many people are searching for something else. Um, and so the values and the expectations of the searcher um, and the guide uh, that also matter uh, for the ways in which uh, these, um, I, I liked it the way you put it, David, um, nonspecific amplifiers work. They will just never conform to uh, the specificities required of our um, sort of regulatory uh, strategies. And so it will be very interesting to me to see how the dispensary system, for instance, works in Oregon and other places. I have always felt 
um, that that type of a system should be, should be. Um, but the uh, difficulties of figuring out how to bring it about and um, what sorts of regulation, because it, it is no free for all, right? It is a different kind of um, regulation. So I think, you know, it, it will be very interesting to see what happens here in the, uh, now that the 21st century is one fifth behind us, uh, what, what your sequel will, will look like. Thank you for posing the question. Ido, final words? Uh, yeah, just want to thank everybody again and thank you for these very thoughtful questions um, um, that we'll, we'll just, uh, I think, take on to, to, the, to the next moments uh, in this ongoing development and development of, of, the, of this experience. Um, thank you. And thank you, Ido, and thank you everyone who participated. It was a wonderful evening. It's not easy on the Zoom, but um, it was it was beautiful, as such a book indeed deserves. So hopefully, we will see you before we're gathered for the next book in a few years. Um, and thank you very, very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. Congratulations. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good and congrats. Aya kef ido. Ede kef, ede kef shaitem. Mazal tov ido ve bamash kol akavod al ma shirgan ta zap shmadim. Wow, tada, ve mamash kef yirad et ha parti. Ve maskim emfargen. Mamash ha kef. Ve afilu eveti reka psikhadeli. Mamash, ken. Bye, Nicolas. Bye, Dar. Mazal Tov. Bye.